Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and can I welcome you all today to today's meeting of the Public Petitions uh, Committee. And as always, can I ask everyone uh, to turn off their mobile phones um, or their electronic equipment because it does interfere with our sound systems. Uh, no apologies have been received to date. Agenda item one is consideration of a current petition. The first item of business is consideration of PE 1517 by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy on behalf of the Scottish Mesh Survivors Hear Our Voices campaign on mesh medical devices. Members have a note by the clerk and a letter received on Friday from NHS to Fees and Galloway. Uh, John Scott, who's got a big interest in this area, has unfortunately got another committee and puts in his apologies. And Neil Finlay, uh, who was here previously, is also attending uh, the committee uh, meeting. And we've also got an extra paper from NHS Grampian and asked members to note that. Uh, members recall that we heard from the petitioners two weeks ago and agreed to invite the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing to give evidence on this important issue. I'm very grateful for the Cabinet Secretary for making himself available so quickly uh, for the committee this morning. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary, Alec Neil and Dr Francis Elliott. Uh, could I also uh, welcome all our visitors to the gallery today. Uh, this is obviously a very important and quite emotional uh, issue. And um, I'd particularly like to welcome all our visitors who have been to the par coming to the Parliament today for the first time. And the only very minor uh, rule to flag up to members is uh, the, the parliamentary rules don't allow any applause in the gallery. So, first of all, can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary, Alan Neil, and invite uh, the Cabinet Secretary to make a very short opening statement that will be followed by questions from myself and followed by all of my colleagues. Uh, Alec Neil. Thank you very much indeed, uh, convener, I, and can I thank you for the opportunity to discuss this issue this morning and uh, also thank the ladies behind me for bringing this to the attention of the committee and indeed the Parliament. I think the first thing to say is that we should all be very concerned to hear how these implants have affected the lives of some women in Scotland and elsewhere. I've personally met with women who have been adversely affected, including Mrs Holmes and Mrs McElroy, and I was deeply troubled to hear how, may, how women affected have suffered, and they have my full sympathy and support, and we'll certainly do everything we can to improve the situation. No one should have to experience the level of suffering that some of these women have had and I want to set out today the actions that the Scottish Government is taking to address the issues raised. I asked the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Dr Elliott, to investigate and recommend actions to address the issues. We estimate that around 1,500 women suffering from stress urinary incontinence and 350 suffering pelvic organ prolapse have synthetic mesh implant surgery each year in Scotland. These conditions result in a reduced quality of life, and I understand that traditional surgery techniques have a high failure rate of between 20 and 30 per cent for primary pelvic organ prolapse surgery. Based on the 2012 York report, a study commissioned by the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, MHRA, it is estimated that around 1 to 3 per cent of women experience complications following stress urinary incontinence surgery, and for POP surgery, the percentage experiencing complications is slightly higher, according to the MHRA, of between 2 and 6 per cent. This, as I said, contrasts with a failure rate in traditional surgery of between 20 and 30 per cent. This means a majority of women, uh, based on that estimate, uh, around 1,450 annually, would appear to benefit from this type of surgery without complications. Uh, and that's not to diminish the seriousness of the situation for those women suffering complications. However, I should add that the percentage of complications is probably substantially underestimated because of the under-reporting and the non-reporting of adverse uh, events. And therefore, these figures I would take as not entirely reliable uh, in terms of their accuracy. I asked Dr Elliott to chair a working group that includes clinicians and patient representatives to consider the issues in more detail. That group has now met twice, and I would like to thank Mrs Holmes and Mrs McElroy for their ongoing contribution to the group. That group to date has made progress. One, it has produced a new patient information and consent booklet for SUI, and I have some copies here with me today for the committee. This booklet will clearly demonstrate the risks associated with this procedure and the alternatives available before women make a decision on whether they wish to proceed. The information in this booklet will be the absolute minimum information provided to patients by NHS boards. Secondly, there are also two patient guidance booklets being developed. 
that set out the pathway for the management of POP and for women who present with complications. Dr Elliott will be working with NHS colleagues to develop this service as a matter of urgency. I can also confirm that in the last year, the Chief Medical Officer has written three times to all GPs through medical directors, alerting them to the possibility that women may suffer complications following insertion of these mesh implants and that all adverse events must be reported to the MHRA, which is the regulatory authority. If I can just explain the regulatory framework, convener. Uh, as you've already heard, the mesh implants are classified as medical devices and are governed through the EU Medical Device Directive. MHRA is a competent authority for the whole of the UK and it has responsibility for the removal of any device from the market for the whole of the UK. Evidence is required in order, obviously, for it to take such a step. Individual medical devices follow procedures set out in the EU directives by manufacturers to gain a CA mark, which is conformity marking, awarded by notified bodies. MHRA oversees the work of these organisations in the UK, performing regular audits. The rules for classifying medical devices are applicable across all EU member states. I've spoken to the MHR Chief Executive and Medical Director about mesh implants and agreed that a dossier detailing the experiences of women in Scotland should be given to them to help them reach a decision on the use of these implants. I was reassured in the discussion with the MHRA that they're taking this issue very seriously and the Scottish Government will continue to assist this agency to provide answers on a way forward. I have another discussion arranged with the Chairman uh, later this month. I've also written to the European Commission, which is currently working towards formulating a scientific opinion on the safety of these devices, and this work will be available in January 2015. We are aware of the US Food and Drug Administration's proposal to reclassify MESH for POP from a moderate-risk device to a high-risk device. Currently, of course, Europe has a 2B classification, which is moderate to high risk. Scottish Government will participate in the UK Working Group. Their remit includes consideration of how data on complications and reporting of adverse events can be improved. This group will meet for the first time next week. Having said all of that, convener, I am convinced that more, however, needs to be done by ourselves here in Scotland. So, in addition to what I have already outlined, I'm announcing today that an independent review will be set up urgently to report on all the issues raised, such as complication rates and under-reporting of adverse events. This review will report in 2015, taking account of the European Commission's study on these devices, which, as I said, is due to be published in January 2015. I hope to announce the specific remit and the chair of the review before the summer recess. Finally, in addition, I have asked the acting chief medical officer this week to write to all health boards to request them to immediately suspend these procedures, both the POP and the TVT procedures, until further, until further evidence becomes available from the two reports next year, the EU report and the independent review that I've set up. I believe that's the right thing to do uh, and that we should base any future decisions on the evidence as presented by these two reports. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Cabinet Secretary, and, and I, for one, uh, certainly welcome your independent view and the issues around uh, suspension. You've um, probably, in your normal sense, predicted one of my questions was you will know that De Vries and Galloway um, have sp suspended the use of mesh devices, and my question was going to be about the wider issues about suspension across Scotland. Perhaps you can comment, first of all, on the De Vries and Galloway uh, suspension as far as your awareness of it is. Well, it, it's technically not a suspension. They simply uh, issued an order from the medical director last year not to use meshes in any of the POP operations in future. And as you know, in evidence to this committee, the medical director in De Vries and Galloway had also called for an urgent review in relation to tapes. 
But uh, uh, at least two other health boards, Highland and Forth Valley, have also put a stop on the use of meshes. So by rolling out the, sus the suspension across Scotland, uh, we make sure that every health board is taking exactly the same position. I I'm glad you've, you've taken this issue so seriously. You obviously followed very closely our deliberations two weeks ago. Um, and I think all the committee were shocked, frankly, by the excellent petition that we heard from Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy. I think the, uh, in all my time chairing the committee, I've, I've not seen sort of the emotion and the tears in the gallery that I've ever experienced in any other petition. And we've experienced many very, very good petitions over the last three years. Uh, I'm sure you, you accept the strength of feeling among women, the fact that one in five uh, mesh implants can go wrong, uh, the horrific uh, physical injuries that, that that can cause. And I would also place on record again my thanks for the Sunday Mail for raising this in issue after issue where they've raised awareness. I'm sure you're aware how I think shocked all the committee members were and that you know, decisive and demanding action was extremely necessary. So I'd just like to put that on the record. Yeah. Can, uh, can I say, Kevin, I've made it absolutely clear from day one that I'm very much on the side of the women on this issue. Uh, very clearly, it is not uh, an uneasy regulatory regime. Uh, because within Scotland, the health boards are the ones who make decisions, uh, which is why I write to request that they suspend, which I'm sure they will do. But also, um, the MHRE is actually the statutory regulatory body, and they operate under EU directives. But it should also be explained that the MHRE's responsibility is primarily in relation to the products, the devices themselves. And the EU directives are very much dealing with the issue of the devices. Now, according to the discussion we had uh, last week with the MHRE, the evidence that they have assembled so far indicates that many of the problems that women have had relate to complications in the procedure and not always in relation to the product. So one of the points I want to be absolutely sure that we include in the remit for the independent review in Scotland is, first of all, to try to get a better handle, a much better handle, on the level of under-reporting of adverse events in relation to these procedures. But secondly, where things have gone wrong, why have they gone wrong? Is it, is it the product? Is it the procedure? Are there unavoidable complications in some cases? We need to get a far, far better understanding if we are to ensure patient safety in these procedures. We also, in the review remit, will include looking at the work in Europe and in the US to make sure that we make sure that in Scotland the best possible uh, policy is adopted once we've conducted that research. I'm absolutely determined to do that. I myself have constituency convener uh, who have been victims. Uh, and in some cases, the mesh implants actually worked, in one case in particular, worked for 12 years before a complication set in. So I, I'm very keen that we look at this over a fairly long period of time because the better understanding we have of it the better we'll be able to get a handle on what needs to be sorted here to make sure no woman has to go through the hell that many of these women sitting behind me have had to go through. Yeah, thank you for that. Before I bring John Wilson in, could I just say if Dr Elliot wishes to speak at any time, please, let me, please catch my eye. Thank you. John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. I too welcome the announcement by the Cabinet Secretary today to ask for the suspension of the use of the, the mesh device uh, in future until uh, we get this issue resolved. Cabinet Secretary, you gave in your opening remarks the part of the difficulty is the accuracy of the information provided to MHRA and also the information collated by GPs and others who are involved in the treatment of the patients who have received th these operations. Could you give an indication of what you can do to find out where there have been historic situations where there has been gross under-reporting of incidents with patients? Because one of the, the issues clearly is that we have percentage figures between 1% and 3% and we can bandy these figures around. But these are only 1% to 3% of the reported incidents, not the unreported. And clearly in the SPICE guide that we received, uh, SPICE information we received as part of today's discussion, uh, they indicate that no one is obliged to report an incident. Could we, uh, or could I ask the Cabinet Secretary, as part of the deliberations on this issue, could we get some historic data to actually ensure that what we're dealing with is accurate information, 
not information that's only being provided if and when a GP or consultant has decided to provide it. Now, can, can I first of all just say that they are obliged to report an adverse entry, uh, event under the Code of, the code of Conduct? Uh, and we have issued, as I said in my introductory statement, uh, clear instructions to remind everybody that they are obligated to report every adverse incident to the MHRA. This is not just a Scottish problem in terms of under-reporting, it's right across the UK. And I think one of the first things we need to do, the MHRA and ourselves, is make absolutely sure that every adverse event uh, is reported. Now, obviously, if we're suspending for the next uh, period ahead, then by definition there shouldn't be any adverse events. But in terms of the historical, the measurement of historical adverse events, that is why I'm setting up the independent review. Now, I don't want to prejudice how the review will do its work, undertake its work, but a very clear part of the remit will be to try to establish what the real percentage of adverse events are. Because very clearly, I mean, one of the the issues that the, the ladies who have spoken to me have highlighted um, is the number of women who have come forward to them. Now, that indicates to me that the, percentage that the percentages officially reported by the MHRA are under-reporting the number of adverse events and doing so significantly. But I don't have the information to say the real figures, 10%, 15%, 20%. I don't have that. But I would like the independent review to try at least and have a stab at trying to get the right order of magnitude of the percentage of adverse events. Clearly, the traditional surgery has a failure rate of between 20 and 30 per cent. Um, I think for, uh, there is clear evidence that the, the failure rate and the complication rate and the adverse event ratio in these procedures is significantly higher than what is officially reported. I'm going to ask a, a Francis to supplement that to reply. Yes, I think it's really important that when we set out the terms of reference for the independent review that we're asking the review to identify the barriers to reporting because, as Cabinet Secretary has mentioned, that within the General Medical Council's duties of a doctor, it's quite clearly indicated that professionals are required to report adverse incidents and, and events to the appropriate bodies. So there must be something that is getting in the way of that happening on a routine basis, and we need to establish that with a greater degree of uh, uh, accuracy than we have been able to do so before. Cabinet Secretary, you also made reference to the fact that part of the problem may be that the procedure itself that was carried out, may, there may be complications with that, rather than just the, the devices being used as part of that procedure. Will your expert group be looking at and breaking down those figures to identify which incidents were caused by the device itself or what complications were caused by the operation. Yeah, that will be part of the remit, to try to get an understanding, a far better understanding of why things have gone wrong. Uh, is it uh, because of the products or is it because of the procedures or is it because of complications, perhaps other problems that some of the women may have? I suspect it's a combination of these factors, but which, which are the more important ones we do not know. And I think it's very important to get a much better understanding of what has gone wrong, because clearly you can't sort it until you know what's going wrong. I, mean, I think the real purpose of this review is to find out what is causing the problem, what is going wrong, because I don't want any woman to go through the hell that uh, these women have been going through. Thank you. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and Dr Elliott. The UK Department of Health has been working on the creation of a register for mesa implants. What discussions has the Scottish Government had with the UK Department of Health over the creation of such a register? Well, I'll, I'll ask uh, Francis to cover the detail, but one of the things we are doing is establishing a database ourselves in terms of the women who have been through, been going through these procedures, because I think it's very clear the lack of a systematic database has been one of the reasons why we don't have the full understanding we need to have as to why things have gone wrong. Um, now, the work is, uh, and we're doing this in consultation with the women's group, and it's part of the, the work that uh, Francis and our working group are actually progressing. So I'll ask Francis to update you on where we're at in terms of the database. 
Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We have been involved in the discussions with both the Department of Health and the MHRA in the work that they're doing with the UK professional bodies. There's um, the um, British uh, Society for Urogynecologists and the British Society of um, B, uh, another acronym, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but there are two professional bodies together with the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. And we've been involved in the debate about using the databases that these societies have to create a single database for all of these procedures and the complications that arise from them. The work that Cabinet Secretary has referred to is the work that we're doing uh, to identify a unique device identifier in Scotland. It's part of the work to address the issues that have been raised in relation to cosmetic surgery, as well as to mesh implants, breast implants, and the, the hip implant problems that have been identified in, in the recent past, and to make sure that any device can be tracked, irrespective of what variety it is and what procedure is used to implant it, so that we have that information for forward um, uh, tracking of what happens to these implants and these devices. So we're involved at high level with our UK counterparts in the discussions and I will be participating in the meeting on the 16th of July with the uh, UK group that's been set up to take this work further as well. Jody. Thank you. Morning, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Dr Elliot. Uh, can I also add my uh, support for the action, having known the Cabinet Secretary for very, very many years uh, the speed of action it does not surprise me. Um, question for you regarding MHRE. Uh, I know we're talking about the database and you know looking at the process. This is not the first time this has come up in terms of products or product devices. Uh, and it's a bit like you know, shutting the door after the horse has bolted. What guarantees can we get from the discussions you're, you've had and you're going to have with MHRA that this kind of situation will not occur again. It's all very well producing products for the marketplace, but not having the process or the yeah. outcome measurements to go with that seems to me highly surprising. Um, I, mean, what, I know you can't give the guarantee because you don't have control over that, that uh, the, 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 the functions that MHRA have yet, but I just wonder what um, questions have been raised as a consequence of this with the MHRA to make sure that they get their processes and their management in, 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 uh, in proper perspective. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, can I say, to be fair to the MHRA, they operate within a European Union dimension and the medical devices directives are basically the very relevant part of international law, European law, relevant to the remit of the MHRA. So they are, in effect, uh, the EU's agent in the UK in terms of enforcing EU regulation. And I suspect that some of the regulation that needs to be strengthened is at an EU level, not just at a UK level. And I think that's one of the things that we'll be able to establish from the report that's due in January. Uh, I think by undertaking the work that we are now undertaking, as Dr Elliott has already outlined, we will be less reliant on after-the-fact uh, regulation. What I'm very uh, keen to do is to prevent any further harm coming to any patient, um, no matter what the device is and no matter what the procedure is. And that really has to be our objective. But I do think the MHRA, I, I was certainly reassured in the discussions I had last week with the medical director and the chief executive that they intend taking a very robust approach to this whole area. Uh, but I think they feel very much as though they're, they're, they're uh, part of the EU regime. I'll ask Francis to, to give you some examples of some of the specifics that they're doing. Yes, can I just add that? The, there is a review of the medical device regulations uh, being conducted within the European Commission. Um, that will not report for some time to come, but it's really important that when there is a consultation on the amendments to it, that we have an opportunity to explain some of the challenges that we face in terms of the implants that have uh, caused problems in, in Scotland, and we're able to make those points robustly uh, available to them in that consultation. Yeah, I appreciate that, that and, 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 and recognise the work that you're doing in pushing back, pushing, if you like, back up the chain. Uh, my question is, and I understand the European Directive, is why MHRA, because this is not the first situation 
as far as I can recall, why they're not doing the same further up chain. Now, you've answered that in terms of uh, the European Commission looking at it. Can I just ask one other question in terms of the relationship with the MHRA? In terms of the briefing that we had, the, it indicates the MHRA has an overarching role in, in the process. But in Scotland, adverse incidents are handled by the Health Facilities Scotland. What's the relationship between the two bodies? How often do they meet? Well, first of all, MHRA is a regulatory body, as I've already explained. Uh, all adverse incidents reported within the National Health Service in Scotland are fed through fa the um, facilities uh, function. Uh, for example, um, in the last year, NHS Grampian and now other boards are starting to treat every single complaint they receive, irrespective of the nature of the complaint or the seriousness of the complaint. They're actually now treating every complaint right across everything as an adverse event. They regard a complaint as an adverse event. Now, uh, the vast bulk of that will not involve the MHRA at all uh, because they have nothing to do with regulation. Uh, it's maybe a procedure gone wrong or, or whatever. That's not a, a regulatory issue. So I think we've got to be clear, adverse events um, are, have a wide definition uh, and that definition is widening there is a percentage that will be in relation to the regulatory remit of MHRA, but the number of adverse events far, far exceeds anything the MHRA would be involved in the National Health Service in Scotland. One last question. Can sorry, Francis, I think Francis wants to answer. Oh, sorry, that. Pardon. Just to answer your question about regular liaison, yes, that takes place between Health Facilities Scotland and the MHRA, as it does between ourselves and MHRA. We've had regular contact about these issues. Kevin Segre, you've written to all of the health boards asking that they suspend. Chief Medical Officer writes right, to all the health boards. Of course, it's going through that process. Uh, how encouraged are you that, how do you feel that they will actually implement the CMO's I, recommendations? I, I think it would be highly unlikely if they receive a letter from the Acting Chief Medical Officer with the backing of the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing that they, I would find it highly unlikely and highly unacceptable if they didn't uh, agree to the request. I'm sure they will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brody. Can I have a very quick question for Dr. Elliot, because I'm conscious of time. At the evidence a couple of weeks ago, um, the, the women who were giving evidence said that it was sometimes very difficult to complain about the mesh implants because when they made complaints to uh, the Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, they were asked for the unique identifier uh, and the time that occurred. And, of course, many of the women involved didn't know that. Can you just confirm that that information now it would appear on the GP notes of each patient in Scotland? Well, the, the unique identifier database will hold that information, which should be in the hospital record and be notified to the GP. So as we introduce the new database for that, we will make sure that there are processes in place to inform the, the clinicians that need to, to have that information. You accept, um, going back in history, that that wasn't possible, so therefore we were in a catch-22 when it was impossible for patients to complain about the mesh implants because they didn't have the unique identifier. Yes, and that's very unsatisfactory from yeah. both the clinical perspective in terms of a record of what was actually undertaken and for the women themselves. Thank you for that. I'll move on to Angus MacDonald. Thank you, um, Camina. Firstly, uh, can I wholeheartedly welcome the, the independent review in, in Scotland and the calls for the, the suspension. Um, just picking up on the, the European review, though, um, according to the, the Sunday Mail last weekend, uh, the investigation by the European Commission uh, into safety issues has appointed a Dutch uh, urogynecologist who had a previous consultancy agreement with Ethicon, uh, the Johnson & Johnson company who uh, uh, produced mesh implants. Um, clearly, it's advantageous to have experts on uh, any review or, or independent panel. However, um, looking at the issue, um, uh, would you share the concerns by campaigners that uh, those with previous vested interests in the industry are involved in the European Commission's investigation, which is clearly separate from the completely independent Scottish one? Well, at the very, very least, there's certainly a presentational problem, but I, I've made it clear to officials that the person who leads the independent review in Scotland must have no such connection and not, must, not, not, not just must be totally independent of any manufacturer or any other vested interest, but must be seen to be independent as well, because it's very important that this review carries the confidence 
of the ladies behind me uh, and the community of women who have been so badly affected by these procedures going wrong and indeed the wider public. So uh, I've made that absolutely clear. When it comes to the remit of the independent review, before I finalise it, I'm going to consult with the patient representatives uh, from uh, the women's group to ensure that they are happy that the remit is satisfactory and robust enough. Okay, thanks, uh, Kevin Setti. I'm sure the campaigners uh, appreciate these comments. Thank you for that. Uh, Anne McTaggart. Thanks, Fina, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary and Dr Elliott. Um, and I welcome, very much welcome, your, your statement in course of action mentioned earlier this morning. Um, can I just ask for some clarity on where we are now and moving forward, um, and just really to compile some of the information that has been spoken about this morning. The expert group, the new patient inf information and the consent booklet, that will be available as of today. Will that be online? Hey, I'll, I'll let the Francis answer that. We're just waiting for the final version and then it will be available both online and a covering letter will go out to all of the health boards in Scotland. I'm hoping that we hope that we would have it for today, but it will be this week. Thank you. And my second question would be um, some the alternatives now um, that you had mentioned and that are apparently listed within the, the consent booklet um, and the information leaflet. Do you have any concerns relating um, to the women presenting today for, for treatment um, about the alternatives, waiting lists or the, the treatment? Do you have any concerns of, of someone that would be presenting today? Just before Francis answers, answers that, because that's obviously a, primarily a clinical question, but in the booklet, when you see it, it actually goes through all the risks uh, in a great deal of detail, and the text of that has been agreed within the working group, which includes two representatives from the patient group represented by the women. Uh, because it's very, very important we look at this from a patient perspective. Uh, and, you know, I think that, that's critically important because, well, we think we're giving all the right information and so on. If, if it's not absolutely clear to the patient, then it wouldn't have served its purpose. So this has very much been uh, involved, the, the women and representatives on the group, because we're very, very determined that we look at this from a patient point of view and not just from a National Health Service point of view. Francis. Yes, I think until we are clear of the reaction to the new booklet and the information, we will not be able to identify if it will cause major issues for waiting times. I don't think it will. Our challenge is in our other two pathways that we're developing for the women who already have these implants and have uh, complications or adverse uh, effects from them in terms of being able to get specialist surgery. Um, or other treatment for them. So that will cause us a challenge, and that's why I'm involved in discussions with our national planning forum, and all the health boards are represented in terms of their st uh, strategic planners to look at the ways in which we can introduce these pathways as quickly as possible and make sure that there are not waiting lists building up for these women. Will that sort of information then, Dr Elliott, be um, discussed within the, the independent review and the expert group? Will, will that be reported back? It will all be made available to the independent review, yes. We will, we will share with them the work that we have done to date and provide the various uh, information booklets and the leaflets and the minutes and uh, the, the documents from our various meetings. As naturally, what we wouldn't want to see is um, women not coming forward now because of treatment um, change in or, or alternatives um, that are available or maybe not available as, as readily as what... It could be. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, can I ask John Wilson? Thank you, Convener. Just a follow-up question uh, to both Cabinet Secretary and Dr Elliott. The, while the announcement has been made today, the, the Cabinet Secretary is going to uh, ask the Chief, Acting Chief Medical Officer to write to all the health boards to suspend future operations. Could I seek clarification as to what advice will be issued to GPs and others in advising patients why the suspension has taken place. Because one of the issues that we're facing is that while we make a suspension, there are women who will, be, who will have been informed that they were going to go through this procedure, who may now be told that they're not going to go through this procedure. Uh, and it's how we manage that uh, in relation to the individuals involved. And equally, how do we get the message or how do we uh, get 
GPs to get the message over to the women who have went through the procedure, who have had an adverse reaction, or women who are concerned because I think, Cabinet Secretary, you gave an indication that one of the uh, situations you identified it was an adverse effect, uh, reaction a number of years after the procedure. So is there going to be specific information provided to GPs and others that they can actually advise their patients, one, on the suspension and the need for the suspension, and two, on how women would report and speak to their GPs about an adverse uh, reaction or worries about an adverse reaction? Well, in terms of the second part of that question, we've already written to every GP in Scotland three times, and that includes information about how to handle the situation that uh, you described, John. So already every GP in Scotland has had you know, three letters uh, and largely covering that uh, second point. In terms of the suspension, the Acting Chief Medical Officer in her letter to boards will obviously uh, make it absolutely clear what advice should be given by clinicians uh, in, in terms of handling the suspension and how they should deal with those women who obviously um, are in some distress because, of course, they have the condition that the procedure is meant to, to rectify, either in terms of the urinary incontinence or the prolapse. Uh, so there will be uh, the acting chief medical officer will include that uh, and make sure that both at board level as well as in the acute sector and in the primary sector appropriate guidance is provided. Francis. We also have other mechanisms in terms of meeting with clinical leaders in Scotland and together with the Acting Chief Medical Officer we will take those opportunities to inform them of the advice that's being sent out and you're absolutely correct, we need to follow through in terms of process issues in the health boards where women are already on waiting lists to be able to allow them the opportunity to have a further discussion with a clinician should they wish to do so. Cabinet Secretary, the one of the joys of sitting at this end of the table is I can see the reaction of some of the, the gallery. Uh, and when you made reference to the fact uh, the GPs had been uh, written two or three times, that there's information available, clearly, from, as I said, from the reaction of some members of the gallery, is that information is not being imparted to the women who are speaking to their GPs. Uh, would it be... Uh, I, I, would, it be would you consider seeking the views of the women concerned themselves and finding a mechanism that they can feed into the working group so that you can get some of the real experiences of women, the way that women have been dealt with by their GPs and trying to report these incidents uh, so that we can actually reflect on some of the, the information. Because I often hear the guidance is given to GPs and to others sometimes that guidance doesn't filter its way down to the patients. And we need to make sure that the patient's views and the patient experience in these circumstances is reflected in any future policies that are developed by the Scottish Government or the medical profession. I've made it very clear from the, the outset that the more evidence we get from the women, the better of where things are not working the way they should be. Uh, I mean, obviously, when you write through the boards to every GP, you expect every GP to read it and then implement what uh, is recommended in terms of the, the letter from the chief medical officer. But if that's not happening, then we need that evidence and we will then work with the respective GPs through their boards to make sure that those problems are addressed. I um, got a quick point, because uh, I'm very conscious of time. I've, a campaigner recently um, emailed me to say that they would advise that it's not the role of the MHRA to carry out initial investigations when adverse incidents occur. And MHRA say they have no independent test facility and that manufacturers are best placed to investigate. So my question, I suppose, to the Cabinet Secretary is who's guarding the guards here? Well, again, I think that's one of the reasons why we might need much more uh, of a robust regime from Europe in all of this, uh, because clearly that's not a satisfactory situation. It's one we're aware of. Uh, and I think all of us, the committee, ourselves as a government, and indeed the, the women themselves, should submit evidence to the EU Commission and that's in their review of devices that uh, Francis referred to. And that's one of the points we should all make. OK, Chip Brody. Uh, very briefly, you mentioned, Cabinet Secretary, the, that the FDA 
has uh, raised the risk level to high risk. What contact, if any, have we had with the FDA or access to information that promoted that change of guidance? The only information that we have is that which is out in the public domain. We haven't had specific contact with the FDA, principally because the MHRA's classification is already moderate to high risk. So that should be the flag for clinicians to understand that there is a potential risk with these devices I, and to I, take that into account. I understand that, Dr Elliott, but, but I would have thought that yeah, the FDA is pretty close to source of manufacture and obviously uh, must have some level of contact with the manufacturer and looking at the processes. So I'm just surprised that we're relying, I'm not surprised because this is a great decision that's been taken, uh, but I would have thought that having substantive information as to why the FDA made their decision would uh, support the strongly the decision that uh, the Cabinet Secretary and you have rightly taken. Yes, we can easily seek that information. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, just before we go to summation, I uh, can ask um, if Neil Finlay can make a very brief comment. I'm um, sorry, pushing for time, Mr Finlay, as you say, we're just overrun. Just to say, I, I warmly welcome the announcement, Cabinet Secretary, but I think given the announcement uh, or the, the letter from the Dumfries and Galloway NHS last year saying that they suspended last year, I don't think you had any option. But I want to pay tribute to the uh, magnificent campaign group behind you who have made this happen. Um, they forced this issue and I think they should be very proud today. My question is, though, why, when we met last year with some of the women, did you advise both myself and them that, A, you did not have the powers to suspend, and, B, that you wouldn't suspend because you feared litigation? Indeed, at that meeting, Dr Elliott said she wouldn't personally have the device fitted because of concerns. Um, according to the figures that you've gave today, that delay means that 1,850 more women risk being injured. So the question, therefore, is, were you given bad advice last year or what happened that you couldn't take that decision at that time? Can I first of all say, convener, it would be a great tragedy if people tried to turn this issue into a party political issue. I think we should all engage in this and unite to try to get a solution to the problem rather than engage in party political point scoring. I have acted with total uh, faith in all of this issue right through. Very clearly, it's an issue that required serious consideration. I've already outlined the regulatory regime. The re regulation of the products is the responsibility on a statutory basis of the MHRA operating within the European Union Medical Devices Directives. And in terms of suspension, it's actually the health boards who have the power to suspend. Uh, I am the chief medical officer is writing to request all the boards to suspend because of the evidence we now have, particularly in relation to adverse events and the under-reporting of them, and I think I've explained why that decision is the right decision. Um, can we make it very, yes, very briefly? Yes, very briefly. Um, the advice that I, uh, I had got from the MHRA yesterday says that NHS Scotland could issue advice for their institutions and clinicians not to use a particular device. So therefore, they would obviously take very much the heed, heed what the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health says. This is not a party political issue. The question is why, when we knew what was going on last year, and when your advisers said that they wouldn't have the device fitted, did we wait a year until we made what is a very welcome announcement, but it is a year on? But, uh, Convener, uh, obviously when you're sitting in my chair you have to weigh up a number of things. As I pointed out, the evidence available to me was of a fairly low rate at that time of adverse events, uh, and that was the advice I got. I'm now satisfied that the under-reporting is much higher than was originally thought uh, in terms of the information available from the MHRA and others. I'm also very convinced uh, that in taking this decision, you have to balance the interests of the women uh, at risk uh, and those who have already had complications against those who have had successful operations. Because even if you take the percentage who have had complications, a fairly high percentage of women, as far as we know, 
have had what they regard as successful operations. And of course, we haven't heard from those who haven't had complications. And it may well be that some of the women who want this procedure, still want this procedure, are not very happy that they, for the time being they can't get it. So there is a balance to be had. Uh, and uh, that's where I've now come to the, the point of view very clearly because of the scale of the underreporting of adverse incidents that this is the right thing to do until we get the evidence from the independent review and from the European report due in January. Thank you for that. I'm afraid we're, we're out of time. If it's ended by 20 minutes, I think legitimately because it's such an important petition. We're now, Cabinet Secretary, at the point of summation, which, as you well know, is there's no further questions or points. It's really a matter for the committee and next steps. My own view is clearly this is a very, very important petition that clearly we need to continue. We need to obviously wait for some information that we requested two weeks ago to come back in. There's been some additional points that have come up. Um, I think last uh, you did mention yourself the important role of Europe. Um, my own view is that when the committee visits uh, Brussels in October, uh, we should seek a meeting with the European Commissioner for Health, um, who's Tony Borg from Malta, who's responsible for health across the EU, because clearly there's issues around the CE mark that you yourself have raised. Uh, also, we've had some requests from um, a lawyer from America, uh, Adam Slater, who wishes to uh, provide evidence to us. He's given us written evidence, which we're still working on, and there may be possibilities if the committee agreed to do a video conference um, on that. Um, so I suppose there's really three things. There's one, I think the committee does need to wait till it's got further information before we make a final decision. Uh, two, I want the committee's view on whether we make the European Commissioner when we're already agreed to be over, it's whether we're running over at the same time. And thirdly, do we um, take part in video conferencing with the American lawyer who's an expert in this area? So there's a number of points here. I think, John Wilson, you wish to come in? I mean, uh, the, the situation uh, in relation to this issue is quite clearly uh, the Cabinet Secretary announced today that there's going to be an expert group going to look in, uh, into this. Uh, it's expected to report in January uh, in relation to taking evidence by video conference from a lawyer in the United States, uh, clearly there are a number of uh, legal firms in Scotland involved in pursuing legal action against uh, the NHS boards and others in relation to this case. Could I suggest that we defer future consideration of this petition until such times as, one, we get the written evidence uh, that we've called for uh, two weeks ago, and two, till we get the report of the expert group in January, so that we can actually then have more detailed consideration of the reports and the consider further uh, taking this forward. Yeah. My own view is that that's a sensible um, step forward, but again, let's hear from other members. Chuck Brody? Yeah, I, I generally agree. I, I mean, there's not one person in the room today who doesn't understand or appreciate the decisions that have been taken. Uh, I would, however, still include uh, the uh, VC with, with yeah, the, Adam the Slater. Adam Slater. Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of information that we can gather can never be too much on this particular subject. Okay. I think we've got a general agreement. It's just a point of detail we need to clarify. Let's just go around the table. Uh, David Torrance. Happy to go along with that, Convener. Okay. Uh, Amit Taggart. Yeah, um, agreed. Um, Angus MacDonald. Yeah, happy to uh, defer consideration. However, I would be keen to, to hear from the American lawyer if uh, there is some pertinent information there. Okay, thank you for that. Jackson Carlow. Yeah, my apologies for missing the earlier part of the meeting. Um, I would agree with the, that proposal. Uh, I think if we can take evidence from Mr Slater, then that's evidence that may well be of value publicly and to any committee uh, that is, at, you know, any group which is looking at the, uh, the matter and by review. Sure. So just to be clear, would you, would you like to do that before um, the, the... Yes, I would, I would be quite happy to have the yeah. video conference evidence, but to otherwise defer consideration as to what next steps we would take beyond sure. the gathering of that evidence. Sure. Uh, John, John Wilson, just come back. I think we are all... Quite, we're quite clear majority view okay. is to take that evidence from the lawyer from the state. Okay. And the final bit that we haven't got conf confirmation on, just to get the committee views, we'd already planned and agreed to go to Brussels in October, subject to obviously community group approval, um, can I just get the committee's view on, if, assuming we are going, the committee's approval that we do seek a meeting with the commissioner, uh, who's obviously based in Brussels. That's Tony Borg. Yes, okay. uh, John, can, 
Convener, I was fortunate to visit the uh, EU uh, and meet with commissioners a number of years ago. I, and I know that commissioners are very keen to hear on the work that's been carried out by committees of this parliament, despite the fact that other places might decide that they shouldn't hear the views of this place. But clearly, I think the opportunity to speak with the commissioner on this issue and possibly other issues uh, of concern would be a great advance, advantage to this committee but, and also to the people of Scotland to get our views over to the commissioners about what's happening in Scotland itself. Thank, thank you. Just to be completely accurate, the, the clerk's quite rightly um, uh, making it clear that we haven't actually confirmed the date. This would also be subject to the conveners group uh, agreement and organisational issues, but perhaps I should rephrase to say, in principle, if we can get a time that's suitable to the parliamentary committees and the clerks and ourselves, um, if the committee are all agreeable, I would certainly be enthusiastic to meet the Commissioner, if that's agreeable. Right. Well, could, um, I, could I thank, um, first of all, the Cabinet Secretary and Dr Elliot for coming along. I think it's been very helpful to see progress on, an, on another health issue. I could also thank Neil Finlay, who's shown a great interest on this issue. And finally, could I thank all our gallery guests uh, who have come along specifically for this issue. I think you've shown, all shown a lot of courage. Um, if you do clearly want to stay on for further petitions, you'd be very welcome. But I do understand if that's not what you wish to do. But thank you all again for coming along today. And I'll suspend for two minutes to allow our witnesses to leave.
goes to the list. If we can restart our committee, so we had some crowd control issues there, and sorry delaying you all. Agenda item two is consideration of new petitions, and the next item business consideration of four new petitions, and has previously agreed the committee to evidence on three of those. The first new petition is PE1521 by George Ecton and Jane O'Donnell on no more page three in the Scottish Sun and, Su and Scottish Parliament. Members have a note by the clerk the spice briefing the petition and the submission from the petitioners. I could also welcome uh, Jackie Bailey, and I'd ask Jackie Bailey, the, after we've had questions, uh, to make a brief contribution. And could I welcome both petitioners? Thank you very much for coming along. And I'm sorry to have delayed uh, both of you today. I'm sure you were uh, watching our earlier contribution. I'm sure you understand how we had to um, overrun. I can I ask Jane O'Donnell to make a short presentation of around five minutes. Um, I'll start off with a couple of questions, then I'll ask my colleague to take it in turns to ask questions. Jane O'Donnell. Thank you, Convener. Uh, my intention for my opening five-minute introduction is just to provide some general information on the No More Page 3 campaign before highlighting the work to date within the Scottish Parliament and then outlining our reasons for bringing both parts of our petition to you this morning. While many have felt uneasy about the prominence and the presence of Page 3 in our society for decades, the official No More Page 3 campaign began in earnest in 2012 with Lucy Ann Holmes, who opened the Sun newspaper the day after Jessica Ennis won her magnificent gold medal in the London 2012 Olympics, to find that, even on this day, the most prominent portrayal of a woman in the newspaper was that of a topless woman, a Page 3 girl, as they're called. Lucy Ann Holmes wrote to the editor of the Sun newspaper at the time, Don McMonaghan, and asked him politely to drop this outdated and highly sexualised portrayal of women in his newspaper. The Sun so far have refused to, to do this. However, since that time, the campaign has grown in strength, striking a chord with men and women across the country. There is a petition hosted at the website change.org, which now has over 195,000 signatures. And here in Scotland, there are bespoke No More Page 3 campaign groups in both Edinburgh and Glasgow. It's important to emphasise now the campaign is not asking to ban the Sun newspaper. The petition calls on David Dinsmore and his Scottish counterpart Gordon Smart to voluntarily remove page three from the newspaper. There have been suggestions that the Sun does acknowledge it's time to end page three. Our most recent example is the interesting one we have, a version of the Sun newspaper being delivered free to households across the UK, and this version of the Sun newspaper does not have a page three girl. Perhaps it's now the acknowledgement that it's no longer time to have soft pornography in a newspaper. In November 2013, there was a members' debate led by Jackie Bailey, who sits with us today, debating the No More Page 3 campaign. I sat in the public gallery with the debate, and I was struck by sincere support across the political spectrum by representatives of all political parties speaking to support to remove Page 3 from the Sun newspaper. The debate in, in November acknowledged the links between portrayals of women, which are demeaning and highly sexualised, and the real issues that we face trying to achieve equality for girls and women in our society. Sexual violence, murder of girls and women by their family and partners and strangers, the inability to achieve equal pay across our industries, and the many issues of poor self-esteem which are affecting the life choices and the potential of young women in our society. Part one of our petition, we call on the Scottish Parliament to urge the editorial team of The Sun and The Scottish Sun to voluntarily remove page three permanently. Why are we asking you for this? It is sexist and it's misogynist. It's yet another relic from this sexist culture of the 1970s. Page three shows a young woman just wearing her pants. She's there to be viewed as a sexual object. She is objectified. She is subservient. She invites men to stay at her for as long as they like, and she'll never complain. Surrounded by stories of men achieving their goals in business, in politics, sporting goals, Page three reminds women they can be viewed as no more than a series of body parts. It's difficult to imagine how a newspaper can respectively and responsibly report on violence and harassment against women and girls while still using the page three feature. Page three normalizes this view of women. It's just a joke, quote, it's just a bit of fun. 
I would refer committee members to the Everyday Sexism campaign, a remarkable campaign which evidences just what women and girls experience every single day in our society as a result of this view. Oh. We have also noted in our supporting evidence to the committee evidence from the United Nations which links readily available sexualised views of women with violence and with sexual violence. Our point is also it's widely available and accessible to children and young people. The Sun and the Scottish Sun portray themselves as a family newspaper. We are not a prudish campaign. We accept there's a normal view of nudity. It's got a place in everyday family life. However, in other areas of the media, we have different views and portrayals of nudity and we have ways to manage that. In films, in TV and bespoke publications. For films, we have useful age-appropriate certification. For TV, we have a recognised watershed. And pornographic publications are still widely available, but they're kept on the top shelf of shops, away from children's eyes. The sun is everywhere. It's got a wide circulation. Copies of the sun can be found in the workplace, in homes, in cafes and bars, and on public transport. We need mature and responsible views of sexuality and nudity as our children grow up in society, not this. Some would argue there's a commercial detriment to the sun newspaper if you remove the page three feature. I think I've said before already, the circulation is wide in Scotland. Are we suggesting that people only buy the Sun newspaper for page three? I doubt that very much. Those of us that still buy newspapers buy it because we like the editorial content, we like the journalistic approach, we like the approach of the publication. And that will be the same for the many Sun readers in, in this country. In Ireland, page three was removed from the Sun last year, uh, the editor citing cultural differences, and it had a negligible effect on the circulation figures. The second part of our petition is we respectfully request the Scottish Parliament takes note of our evidence and in recognition of the equalities framework and the dignity at work policy you have here at the Scottish Parliament that you agree to remove the Sun and the Scottish Sun from the Parliament building on a temporary basis until the editorial team agree to permanently remove page 3 as a feature of the newspaper. Thank you for your time and we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much for uh, making your statement in such a clear and hel a helpful way. Uh, and also, Mr Ecton, if you want to come in at any stage, just please catch my eye. Um, I have a couple of questions from my, colleague, uh, my colleagues. And your campaign has obviously had widespread support, I think, both from the Scottish Government and, indeed, uh, Police Scotland and across the political divide, as you've said. I mean, what positive actions can we do to help your petition succeed? I think, first of all, we'd be looking for MSPs right across um, the political spectrum to sign the petition um, to, to, to support the No More Page 3 campaign. We do think the Scottish Parliament has an influential voice in our society, now perhaps more so than ever as we as a country consider what Scotland means going forward for the future. So there is a lot of influence that the Parliament can have to add your voice to support us to ask page three to be removed voluntarily from the Sun and the Scottish Sun. I suppose I'd highlight the, uh, the ability for Parliament to hold the executive to account as well. Uh, recently there's been a clear what you could view as an endorsement by Glasgow 2014 in the Scottish Sun, relevant to the Sun Plus, which, just for your awareness, and I'm sure we might get onto the issue of availability online, the website, the Sun Plus website, that is the electronic version of the Sun, hosts a back catalogue of objectification of women, where women can be spun 360 degrees for the viewing pleasure of presumably men uh, and presumably adults, but there was a clear Glasgow 2014 logo endorsing a Team Scotland uh, T-shirt for joining the Sun Plus in that newspaper two weeks ago. So it's again the issue there of holding relevant executives to account. I've written, as you'll see in the evidence, to the Cabinet Secretary in question, asking for reassurance that this was clearly involved no public money and no uh, public decision. Because I think there's there the influence of, yes, we clearly have had support from the Scottish Government, but... We'd also like to see that followed through in actions as well. Mm. And again, we're not asking for a ban, and I think other people have asked for economic sanctions, including the Sun themselves, for countries that have human rights abuses against women and children mm. in regard to the Bring Back Our Girls campaign. Mm. So I don't believe that that's inappropriate to ask of the Parliament as well. Okay, that, and my final question for us, my colleagues, to come in. Um, as you'll uh, both be aware, the Privy Council approved the Royal Charter on press regulation. Do you feel that concerns about portrayal of women in the press can be dealt with under this new regulation? I think there's, there's a difficulty expressed at the moment in terms of how we transpose Article 10 of mm. the European Declaration on Human Rights. At the moment, my understanding is from the UK Constitution is we transpose it unedited. Therefore, unlike Norway, 
where they say you have complete freedom of expression and they also have a constitution where it's freely written as well, not get into the constitutional argument at all. But Article 100 of the Norway Constitution says there are clear limits on freedom of expression, and they are X, Y, and Z. At the moment, within the UK Constitution, null arrangement, we don't have that. And therefore, I don't believe that self-regulation by the press is appropriate. And I'd, I've written as well in terms of I don't believe page three is really an appropriate defence of press freedom. Press freedom is meant to protect those journalists who risk their lives to expose mm. serious detriments to human rights. Not so a young lady can be objectified mm. from a narrow cohort of society mm. on page three daily of each newspaper. I do not believe page three is an appropriate defence of press freedom. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you for that. And I'll bring in my colleagues. Uh, Chick Brody. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let me be very clear. I... Uh, agree generally in terms of you, you, not totally with everything you, you've asked for. I'm very much in favour of gender equality. I suffered some time, some years ago, by promoting women as managers, because they're a lot better managers than men, actually, in the commercial environment. Uh, so I understand, perhaps, some of the issues. So I want you to take my questioning in the manner which it's portrayed, which will be fairly robust but recognising that uh, I certainly, and I'm sure shared by many of my gender, uh, revere uh, the opposite sex for what they do and what they are. What other organisations have you challenged in terms of portrayal of women as you claim are portrayed in the sun? I think I'll, I'll, I'll start this process. The, so. We absolutely accept that there's a wider issue with regard to... Field. So why have you picked on the sun? The sun, because it's so famous. It's, it's part of the culture. It is a brand, the Page Three Girl brand. And the campaign has been the, working since 2012, although I said hopefully at the start, it's been a concern for a number of years. I think there are different views of women in our society which can be difficult. We, we want to see a wide range of views of women, not only taking into account the different ways we all look and that all being acceptable, but all the things we achieve and all the things we do. Page three just removes that in its entirety. It's the perfect example of a brand of women that reduces women, as I said, to a sum of their body parts. There is no... What do you say to the women that take part in that, who want to take part in it? I think there is... There's clearly a, a job there, glamour modelling, and there's other publications which allow that. I think I said that. They tend to be kept on the top shelf. They're in other versions of media. The internet's not on the top shelf. No, but we have other ways to protect children. Children are trained that. We don't train our children or look after our children enough to explain this. And we've had conversations amongst ourselves, both here our parents, trying to explain the page three phenomenon to a child. I have a 12-year-old daughter. She just doesn't understand why there's a naked woman in a newspaper. She cannot understand why that would be there. I grew up in the... I was born in the 1970s. I'm with a generation that's always been there. It's always been part of my life. And it's been so many different examples of, of during my life where I've been in different situations where this, this brand, this feature, has played a role and has reduced me to, to feeling less than I was able to, to realise less than my potential. It is the number one objectification of women. It is readily available to everybody in our society because of its, its right. circulation. Uh, on the basis that you may or may not know that we did a very thorough inquiry into child sexual exploitation, which covered boys uh, uh, as well as girls, uh, are you seriously conflating the fact that 300,000 women that are sexually assaulted and 60,000 women are raped each year in the context of page three of the sun? Uh, I don't think it's necessarily us, because what we're saying is there's a footnote there that says breaking the cycle, the international trade union movement, would recognise that. And also the UN Commission on Women would recognise it as a very broad spectrum and a continuum of issues here. Now, you did ask, and I'll probably try to go back to the issue of who else have we tackled. I'm currently in the end stage of the process of an appeal to the BBC Trust over the lack of equality and the use of BBC assets to promote sexism via the sun, in my view, in relation to CBeebies. Uh, so I've challenged also Tesco. Those words are from the Usdor Labour Union of shop workers who do see a relationship 
Now, I've, I've asked the Assistant Chief Constable as well of Police Scotland, who quite clearly sees a relationship and has identified that there are academic studies which he's willing to police by. Uh, so I think we are here talking about the issue of prevention. An equally safe strategy that's going to be forthcoming from the Scottish Government and, I believe, Scottish local government looks at the issue of prevention and preventing the next generation suffering the same issues. I, I, I must admit, I tried to explain to my four-year-old son this morning where Daddy was going because I wasn't going to work and I had my shorts on and I had my page, my T-shirt on, which thankfully I've reversed, otherwise you were going to be objectifying me because I don't have any, anything else on me at, this morning. I found it easier to explain gravity to a four-year-old who has been to the Glasgow Science Centre at weekend than I did as to why there is a lady in a newspaper. He said, Daddy, isn't there meant to be news there and words? than there is in explaining that. I, I simply couldn't do it. I could explain gravity, I could explain particle physics easier than I can while there's, a, while there's basically a naked woman in the newspaper. Well, on the basis that you can explain gravity, could you explain civil liberty to me? Civil liberty in terms of the Human Rights Act, i.e. freedom of expression? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So it's the right, presumably, that everyone has individual rights to express themselves freely and democratically. So, yet, do the yet, on, do yet, excuse me, oh, sorry, if you've asked me a question, can I answer okay. it, sir? Thank you. If there is detrimental harm to an individual, I believe the Human Rights Act and the Convention of Human Rights that we've enshrined in Europe allows the opportunity to make legislation to protect those individuals. Right. Where's your evidence of detrimental harm uh, to people? I mean, I know you've conflated it with with these numbers, but there are many other organisations that uh, could apply. I mean, I'm not saying I support it, by the way, uh, or any of the other organisations, but you've chosen to conflate it with, with, with page three. I still ask where, in terms of civil liberties, which the editor of The Sun is entitled to enjoy as much as, as, as those who choose not to read it, um, where, where's the evidence that page three does the detrimental harm that you say it does? I think I would, I'll, I'll start a response to that. The Sun is a newspaper. It's there to provide news stories and to reflect current affairs. That, that's what the, the, the purpose of the Sun newspaper is. So in relation to freedom of expression, the editor of the Sun and the Scottish Sun, according to this argument, would say, well, we've got the right to show a naked woman in the newspaper. Only I'm, if she agrees. Only if she agreed. Well, yeah, of course. I'm a, when we, we know that many young women do choose to go into this profession. We also know from the Nailmore Page 3 campaign site, and I would refer you to it if you get a chance, to look at some of the survivor testimony of girls and women who have been part of that and have, have had a very negative experience of that. However, it is a newspaper. It's there to, to explain news and current affairs. If people want to express a certain view of nudity or pornography, etc., there are other mechanisms for them to do that which doesn't affect the people who don't wish to see it. You have, as I said, age-appropriate certifications in cinema. We have different views of sexuality, <clears throat> different views of nudity, and we have ways to make sure that that is dealt with responsibly and that it's appropriate for those who see it. We have the same with the television. There's many you know, concerns or complaints about the television, but generally broadcasters tend to adhere to the 9pm watershed. So as parents, you know that after nine o'clock, if your child picks up something you didn't want them to see, well, then you, there's a responsibility you have towards that. As, and as an individual, I can also choose to use these different mechanisms to what I feel is, is, is acceptable to me. I cannot, and I cannot influence or control this at all, and neither can any of the other women or the girls in our society who are affected by this. And we talk about being a newspaper. And I think the campaign says it's very well. Do you expect on the six o'clock news that George Alagaya is going to introduce Syria and say, but stop for a moment. Here's 22-year-old Casey from, that, from Warwick. That, that is a, a nonsensical argument. You, no, it's, you it's, it's, forgive me, what, what? it is the argument. It is the argument because there's no role for a naked woman in a newspaper. Well, I've said again, we accept there's a role for nudity. We accept there's a form of different sorts of nudity. And that will be dealt with in different forms of media but not within the pages of a daily newspaper. What other areas of censorship do you approve of? On, on a personal basis? I, I'm asking you the question. I'm, what other areas of censorship do you approve of? I don't see this as a form of censorship. 
I think I'd make that very clear. We're not banning anything. We're not making anybody do anything here. We're asking David Dinsmore and Gordon Smart to voluntarily acknowledge that this is a view of women that belongs in the 1970s with Savile, with all the other awful things that have come out recently in our society. And we're saying no more of this. And we want them to say, you're right. And actually, as media representatives, we have a way to portray very positive views of women. Let's use page three to support women who are active and sporty because that's so difficult so to achieve without So did Michelangelo people. and Picasso. Right. Um, on that very interesting point, can I ask Anne McTaggart if she would like to make a question? Thanks, convener, um, and thank you very much for your, your questions and your answers so far. Um, I fully support and have signed up to the No More Page 3 for, for all the reasons that you have given, um, Mr O'Donnell. Uh, you're exactly right. The newspaper is there for, for, to deliver news. And it is readily available. And I am just so, so surprised that our Scottish Parliament, um, given that you had been here this time last year, was it this time? Or, or, or you've been here before where Jackie Bailey, MSP, had, had um, taken forward a debate and at that point was asked for the presiding officer for to look at um, the Scottish Parliament's equalities framework. Um, I'm quite unsure as to why that's not been done before now. Um, there was a great deal of support at that, on that debate. I, I just think it's a no-brainer. Um, I'm, I'm not really quite sure why, why the Sun newspaper don't see the same. So I'll fully back your, your campaign. Just like in terms of returning to the issue of censorship, I suppose the issue here is, as well for the Scottish Parliament and as well for the BBC, is... I, as a member of the public, and I was sadly, probably to avert my uh, eyes from the, uh, my England team losing at football uh, to Italy, was reading back over equalities frameworks and also the 1881 Libel Act, which I think is the only act currently in force that actually specifies what a newspaper should be in the UK. It's a, there's a common law interpretation, but actually it's a very short definition, and it says that a newspaper should impart intelligence. Now, I learnt pretty quickly what the uh, biological differences and atomological differences are between a man and a woman. I don't believe that boobs are still news, therefore uh, that would be my reflection. But quite clearly, all, I have, all we've done in this petition is reflect upon what the stated equalities framework is under the Equalities Act of the Parliament and applied it and asked the question of the Chief Executive as to why you stock it. And the answer was, it's popular. So therefore, I expect you also stock Playboy and other magazines on the basis of popularity. I doubt it because you simply couldn't do it by your dignity at work policy because it says pin-ups. Page three is a pin-up. Therefore, it's a very straightforward question of yeah. we have applied the equalities framework to the papers that you sell. And we would hope, as our democratic representatives you would see that through. Now, I don't believe that's inappropriate. I also think, as well, I'm quite happy to go with the Assistant Chief Constable of Police Scotland, where he says it is a continuity and a spectrum of objectification. Where it starts, you are aware of an issue, you then become, it becomes habitual, and other things happen at the end of it. We appear to have accepted that in our drugs policy and other forms of public policy. I would say it happens here. But I'm sorry, we're a bit pushed for time. I'm just wondering if any other member wishes to... Yeah, Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you. Good morning. I, I'm, I'm sort of sympathetic to the arguments that you're making. I'm just not quite sure of the formal process arising out of the petition that you would like. I mean, firstly, it is the case there was a members' debate on this subject and spokespeople for all parties within the Parliament uh, spoke in favour of the petition's aims. So... In a sense, the Scottish Parliament has already expressed in a debate within the Chamber the very point that you are asking the petition to do. So I suppose my first question, I'll bundle them together, would be to say I'm not quite sure how you would like us to further uh, represent that view. Parliament has already done it. Um, so I'm not sure whether you're looking for a formal government uh, motion on business with a vote at the end of it or... Or what? But I don't think there's a mechanism beyond that 
um, for Parliament to express a view because Parliament is a collection of the members of the Parliament who would have to, I suppose, contribute to that expression. But my first point would be I think we've done it. Secondly, I just that you were gilding the lily for me a bit when you said that the sun is there to explain news and current affairs. Um, <laughs> mm, uh, I, I, and I'm not quite sure that, and I thought you did, uh, Mr. Rector, sort of suggest there was a slightly less defined interpretation of what a newspaper ultimately is. I mean, on that basis, it wouldn't give us TV listings, it wouldn't tell us about Big Brother, it wouldn't tell us about a whole lot of other things I could probably well do without knowing about too. But I suppose the Sun, from some, from time to time, like all other newspapers. Uh, has managed to break an, uh, an important and sometimes an exclusive news story, uh, which may be of very considerable interest and importance within uh, to Scotland and within the Scottish Parliament. Now, at one point in your evidence, I thought you went further um, and talked about the publication being banned on the premises of the Scottish Parliament, as opposed to it just no longer being stocked or sold on the premises. Um, and I suppose I would have some concerns if that were the case, uh, because then I suppose it might even be, one could argue by extension, that members would not be allowed to refer to it because it was a publication that was prescribed. So I have two concerns. One, um, have we not already given expression as you would like in the petition and what more would you like us to do? And secondly, just do you understand the slight concern I have about the... Uh, prescription of the publication within parliamentary premises um, when it might be something to which there is a legitimate need to refer. Um, I'll pick up your second point first. Um, perhaps that was semantics on my part, where the petition calls specifically that the Sun newspaper, the Scottish Sun newspaper, are not stocked or sold within the Scottish Parliament. Um, and that's specifically referring to your equality framework here and your dignity at work policy. Um, I think if there were individuals who wish to access that material, that content, for, for whatever reason, because you need to refer to it, then we would say that content is all available online, so you don't need to have a copy of the, the, the sun in, 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 in the building. And I would also suggest that there may be some of your colleagues and the, the staff who work here that are maybe felt uncomfortable if there was, there was copies of the sun newspaper being used in, in, in a public area. But for the purpose of this petition, we're calling for the Scottish Parliament to no longer stock or sell the Sun newspaper. In relation to your first point, it was a, it was a great debate in November. And I, it was the first time I'd come to the public gallery and watched the debate, and I was absolutely taken uh, with the whole process. And the strength of feeling right across the political parties. It was a really great debate, and, and, and I enjoyed it very much. However, I think moving on from the debate, I don't think as a campaign we've seen all we'd want to see in relation to endorsement from the Scottish Parliament. It was a positive debate. Everyone signed up to it. Everyone said, yes, you're absolutely right. We had um, MSPs who made the link between violence to women and sexually sexualised views of women. We had other members who said, surely if we need to think about banning this publication, that was, that was, that was a, a quote by a, an MSP at the debate. What we're looking for is that the Scottish Parliament and maybe perhaps the, this petitions committee would write to the Sun and the Scottish Sun to say you've heard our evidence and that you would I'd lend your support to our campaign and ask them to voluntarily remove the page three feature from the newspaper and that you find in favour of the second part of our petition and note for their interest that the Sun and Scottish Sun would not be stocked or sold on the Scottish Parliament premises until that's the case. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, any further questions from the colleagues? Um, if not, can I ask Jackie Bailey if she would make a brief okay. statement? Thank you very much, convener. Um, I just make an observation at the beginning that I find it very interesting that we as a parliament don't allow somebody to wear a T-shirt bearing a No More Page 3 slogan, yet we allow boobs to be on newspapers freely available in the parliament where we have hundreds of children visiting um, on a weekly basis and where we pride ourselves on the very strong and positive images we have of women, particularly as representatives, in the Parliament. So, you know, I just make the observation that perhaps we've got our priorities just slightly wrong. However, that said, um, I'm very supportive of the petition. As you've heard, it seeks to do two things. One is about not stocking or selling the Sun on the Parliament on a temporary basis, um, whilst we all encourage the Sun to do the right thing, which is to remove page three. Um, 
I do genuinely believe page three is out of date. I'm sure my colleagues share my concerns when they're sitting on the train and somebody opens it up in the morning and you're sitting there, you've probably not had breakfast, you're half asleep, and you see a naked woman in front of you, as if that is you know, how women are and how women should be portrayed. It does belong to a kind of deeply sexist culture that I thought we had left far behind. Now, Parliament as an institution prides itself on having a robust equality framework. We pride ourselves on having great dignity at work policies for all our employees, and rightly so. But can I just observe again that that is only as robust as its implementation? And if you apply those policies to the Sun newspaper in the Parliament, then we don't measure up. And that's something that the Parliament should be concerned about. Um, but it's not just the Parliament, it's also government, government of successive political persuasions have all said that we have to have equality at the heart of everything we do. We talk in terms of income inequality, we talk about health inequality, we talk, of course, about gender inequality. Yet here is an opportunity to do something to encourage that gender inequality that we aspire to. Um, and can I say as gently as I can, to borrow a phrase from the First Minister, to Chick Brodie. Do you know, when we had the debate in November... The Minister, now the Cabinet Secretary, rightly noted the link between sexualised images of women and the likelihood that sexual predators and criminals were more likely to inflict violence on women because we see them simply as a collection of body parts because that's how the sun portrays them. There is a clear link, there is a continuum, and I see you shaking your head, but you know, if, Strath if Police Scotland now even recognise themselves as a continuum of objectification of women and violence um, as a consequence of that, then surely Chick Brodie can be persuaded like cries. But the Scottish Parliament recognised it in their debate cross-party. The Scottish Government, your own government, agree to. And I hope that this committee will do likewise. Councils across Scotland are actually now beginning to remove the sun from their public libraries because they recognise that the objectification of women is something that is out of date and out of touch. Can I say, following the debate, I did indeed write to the editor of the Scottish Sun, one Gordon Smart. Um, he did eventually reply. He clearly is a busy man. Um, I don't think we'll be meeting any time soon. Um, he did, in fact, say something that was quite interesting, that this was an editorial decision for David Dinsmore, the editor of The Sun um, down in London. Um, I think the Scottish Government had agreed to write. I'm not sure whether they've actually done so, but I think it would be a very powerful thing. One, if the Scottish Parliament applied its equality framework and its dignity at work policy, and two, if the Scottish Parliament too led the charge to ensure that there is no more page three in the Scottish Sun um, by equally as a committee writing to the Sun editor. Thank you, Jackie Bill. Uh, John Wilson. I mean, I'm not sure uh, if this is fair on Ms Bailey to answer this question, or maybe Ms O'Donnell may take the opportunity to answer it. We're calling for a ban, a temporary ban, until we remove page three uh, from the Sun newspaper in the Scottish Parliament. Would you go as far as to say we should also withdraw the press credentials of Sun journalists in this building? Uh, as part of this uh, action against the Sun. I'm just seeing this for clarification because the thing is that at the, same, at the same time as you're talking about banning a newspaper, we, are, we continue to have press credentials issued for Sun journalists who act on behalf of that publication in this building and report on issues and matters that take place in this building. Uh, and would the logic of your argument about banning the Sun in the building... <laughs> Uh, or being available in the building, also extend to the potential to withdraw press credentials from just, journalists? Just bring it, um, could I direct that question to the petitioners, because Jackie Bailey is obviously not witness. Uh, Jane O'Donnell? That's okay. <laughs> That's right. I... I uh, think, and I hope I've, I've made this clear, I think the Sun newspaper has a role to play in our society. It is a publication. It provides news articles, etc., and it will provide news information about the work of the Scottish Parliament to its readership. That's very important. That's something we all firmly believe in. To use your argument, we could also find that information online and report from the information provided online by the Parliament. 
That's true. I think I, well, I, what my understanding is, I'm not a journalist and I'm not here to speak for them, is they would say they like to speak to the MSPs, to the clerks, to the officers that support them so they get the truth of the matter and portray it as well as they possibly can. I would love to see the Sun newspaper to continue to do well in Scotland without the page three feature. No one in this campaign is calling for an end to the Sun. We don't want to see it lose its circulation figures. We want to see it continue to do well, but just to remove that feature. Two things. We're asking you to apply the Equalities Act to public bodies. So, therefore, there would be an implication, therefore, that you may be transposing the general duty or the protected characteristics. I've also got an issue that whilst my mum supports the campaign here, she'd be a very unhappy auntie if you made my cousin in some way, shape or form redundant, who is the Home Affairs Editor for the Scottish Sun, which I believe would perform a public duty in terms of reporting news out with the Parliament, but we're applying your equalities framework to the newspapers that you stock, and that's what I asked the Chief Executive when I spoke to him, and it's what Jane has intimated in her evidence. So I think we are trying to keep this, as we were asked by the clerks when we presented the petition to you, as focused as possible. So we did wish a wider petition, but we were asked to be as focused as possible. Thank you for that. A very brief question from um, Mr Brody. I'm conscious I don't particularly want to open this up to a larger philosophical debate just because of time, but Mr Brody. Yeah, I, I, I just, first of all, it clearly, Ms Bailey, probably not for the first time, didn't listen to what I said in my opening uh, uh, peroration. But having said that, we're talking about fairness and equality. And there are, I mean, I'm not saying I support the, the, the son doing this. Uh, I can't pretend. I read it a lot. Uh, and it tends to be the sports pages, but you know, we, we're, we are talking about fairness and equality and civil liberties. Now, if there was a compulsion uh, for young ladies to, to to appear on page three, I would understand that there is a, there is a you know it's not just a newspaper. Clearly, they're promoting it, but you know there are those who glamour models, etc. And by the way, this is not just restricted. To the Sun, yes, it's a very popular uh, 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 paper. But if you go and look at some of the women's magazines in terms of, you know, big hunks or whatever they call them, uh, you know, in, in, in there, yeah, the commentary with with some of it is is, is ridiculous. So my my issue is, I'm not saying I, I support the, the 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 page the issue, but what I do really ask is that we are fair, we are equal and we understand our obligations to civil liberties. Thank you, Mr. I'm very conscious we could have a much longer debate today, and I'm not trying to stifle debate. I'm just very conscious that we're running very late on this issue. We're now, we're now at the summation point, which you'll probably know from the previous petition, is where we've ended the questions, and it's up to the committee to come to conclusions, but I'd ask you to stay where, where you are. Um, could ask then committee members for their views. Obviously, there's... Um, issues about asking the Scottish Sun about the petition, the presiding officer who is responsible for the conduct within the Parliament and the Equality and Human Rights Commission. John Wilson. Yeah, I have to put on record that I've been a supporter of the No More Page 3 since the 80s uh, and I'm glad that other newspapers used to carry Page 3 like the Daily Record, the Daily Mail and others. Uh, Daily, sorry, Daily Mirror, not the Daily Mail, my mistake, in terms of Daily, offend Daily Mail readers. Uh, but in terms of the campaign, uh, then, as I said, I'm fully supportive of the campaign and I just uh, had to ask that question because once you start looking at uh, temporary bans or whatever, then you have to take it uh, to the logical extension uh, and what that may mean. But, could, Kavina, could I suggest we also write to the Sun newspaper and ask them in particular about the removing page three feature because I find the page three feature uh, prohibits me from reading the Sun particularly the editorial, which is always on page two, which it coincidentally just happens to be opposite page three, so I don't know what the Sun's trying to say about their editorials. But in relation to uh, the distribution, the national free copy of the Sun that took place recently, and Miss O'Donnell made reference to the fact that it did not contain a page three feature in that free newspaper, and asked them the reasons why they felt it necessary to distribute a free newspaper and felt it relevant not to include a page three feature in that publication. The other uh, point I'd like to make, Convener, is could I suggest we write to the NUJ 
because I'm sure the NUJ will have a view on this particular issue and it would be interesting to get the NUJ's point of view in relation to what ostensibly is a publication which involves NUJ membership. Can, can I just focus on one thing at a time in, on the back of Mr Wilson's suggestion? The first one, can we just concentrate on, is the committee agreeable to write to the Scottish Sun in terms of the petitioner's request, plus the issue that John Wilson raised about the free copy? So that's, can we, that would need to be the Sun nationally convenient. Yes, that's the Sun nationally. So it's, it's the Scottish Sun and then the Sun nationally. That's two different aspects of that. Uh, Jackson Carlow? Uh, could I ask that we also write to the Chief Executive of the Parliament asking for a schedule of the numbers of copies of this paper which actually are stocked, displayed or sold within the Parliament campus? Uh, because I'd like to know where is it actually. I'm aware myself that there are a couple at the coffee bar for sale and there is usually one on display in the members' uh, lounge and possibly restaurant. Uh, and there's a paper, a copy of the paper in Spice, which is not open to the public. Uh, so I would, I think it would be helpful to understand from the Chief Executive how many copies of the paper does Parliament yeah. actually purchase, and where are they within yes. the parliamentary campus? Yes. I hope they're not all on the offices of any one right. political party. Um, can I also um, suggest that we write to the leaders of each of the political groups within the Parliament, asking them f to establish the views of their group in relation to the aims of the petition as advertised, because clearly if it enjoyed yeah. cross-party support across groups, perhaps from members expressed in a way that might not wish to sign the motion per se, but that would be useful to understand as well. Right, thank you. On the point about uh, whether it's stocked or not, that's an easy answer to, if we write to the Secretary of the Corporate Body, and we can ask to do that very easily. I mean, first of all, on that point, are members of Google, we, we do that? Which is yeah. And secondly, we had a point from was John Wilson asked about writing to the NUJ? Yes, okay. give me the National Union yes. journalists. Uh, are members agreeable with that course of action? Thank you. And just to confirm, because it wasn't quite clear uh, what members' views were, or we, A, are committee agreeable? We write to the Scottish Sun in terms of the petition's request and write to the Sun nationally about the free copy issue. That's two separate issues. Is that agreeable? Yep. Thank you. Yes, Angus MacDonald? Following on from that, um, in, the, in the briefing that we received from the clerks, it was noted that uh, in February 2013, uh, Rupert Murdoch, in response to a tweet about page three being old-fashioned, uh, suggested he was considering whether to remove page three and replace it with a halfway house with glamorous fashionistas. Um, now, <laughs> I like to think I'm one of those, by the way. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if it would be within our remit uh, to perhaps contact a uh, direct uh, Rupert Murdoch uh, to advise us if um, he's moved on from his original suggestion that uh, he was considering removing page three. Okay. Um, we have another request from Angus Madol for our committee's views on that. Members wish to write to Rupert Murdoch. Check, Brody. Well, I, I just have a general concern. I mean, it's, a, it's clearly of a totally different dimension. Uh, and I, yeah. As I said earlier, I wouldn't advocate reading it. I just get very concerned that it's like, it's of a different dimension, but say no to Tesco, and, yeah. you know, particularising that when, if there's a larger problem, then we should have a proper inquiry and, 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 and ask the appropriate bodies. So I could I just sort of nag the committee just to focus on the individual request, because otherwise we'll be here for some time. We've got a request to write to Rupert Murdoch. What is the committee's view? No. OK, Chip, for opposed. John Wilson? I'd be minded to write to Rupert Murdoch, uh, if not the Rupert Murdoch individually, but the corporation itself. Okay, David Torrance, um, yes or no? Yes. The corporation itself. Yeah. Jackson, Carlo. I think I'm minded to wait until we have received um, responses to the other inquiries that we have had. I just wonder whether that course of action might open us up to uh, a slightly more lurid and sensationalist it, treatment of the petition so, than we agreeing, would otherwise not wish. Not disagreeing with the principles, just the timing. Yeah. John Wilson, is your bit timing? Are you happy to wait, or do you, would you push the... Sorry, it was Angus MacDonald who pushed it. Uh, do yeah. you want to push it now, or do you want to wait? No, I mean, I'd be content to, to, to wait, but we should still keep it okay. as an option. So let's, let's put that on the back burner. Is there any other suggestions for ways forward? I'm at target. Right, I, I'm not sure if we've got to this, but the Cabinet Secretary who had been involved... Can we ask, has she done what she says she, that she was going to do? To which is right to, 
Right, are members agreeable to write to the yes. Cabinet Secretary? She may well have that reply, but could we have that, can you, that information? So there, there is a number of suggestions which the current recruitment right, if I've missed any, but uh, we're writing to the Scottish Sun in terms of petition, asking the views of the petition, writing to the UK Sun in terms of the free issue, the writing to NUJ, writing to leaders of the political parties, writing to the corporate body to determine the numbers that uh, of the Scottish Sun that are stocked, and we're holding fire on the Rupert Murdoch issue until we get the other replies. Uh, very quickly, Anne, the target. Uh, the Ireland, the, the newspaper in Ireland, could, could we have some research as to what impact that's had to the newspaper? Sorry, Since which newspaper? No. The Sun newspaper. Sorry, the Sun newspaper in Ireland had stopped page three. We ha had heard from evidence today. Oh, yeah, Jane, I think Jane O'Donnell referred to that. Right. So could we yeah. find Sorry, out we're past the question stage. Sorry, we're just at the summation. Right. Could we have some evidence of, of how that... OK. Th thank you. Well, th certainly if the petition is any further information to help us, that would be great for Steve. John, Wilson? Yeah, just, just for clarification, Convener, I was suggesting that we write as a committee at some stage to News International, not to do Right. right. Uh, just to, sort of I, I think the committee did pick that yeah. up. Well, well, thank you very much, members of the committee, for all these uh, variety of suggestions. Uh, can I thank the petitioners? As you can see, we are pursuing this on num a number of uh, fronts. Uh, thank you both for coming along and uh, for your very articulate uh, input to this committee deliberations. I can thank Jackie Bailey uh, also for her very articulate contributions to the committee as always. Um, and I'll suspend for two minutes to allow our uh, witnesses to leave and our new witnesses to join us. Thank you very much. Uh, the, if I can restart our committee, we're on our second new petition. It's PE1518 by George Chalmers on meaningful public consultation within the Scottish planning system. Members have a note by the clerk, despite a briefing in the petition. Can I welcome Mr Chalmers to the meeting? Thank you very much for coming along, and I apologise for keeping you late. Um, I'd ask if you could make a short presentation, no more than five minutes, and I'll start off by asking some questions, and then my committee members will okay. follow. I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to air my views on the Town and Country Hierarchy of Development Scotland Regulations 2009 and to voice my opinion that in the particular case of the major developments criterion is being treated as if it were no more than a voluntary code of practice and as such can be and is ignored with impunity as and when it suits the developer. I am not in any way an expert in the planning system or planning regulations in Scotland. My interest in the planning system was triggered in 2010 by curiosity. Curiosity as to why a developer would submit two applications for one development adjacent to my property and our local authorities' initial reluctance to engage in dialogue on the issue. After much googling of the planning regulations, it became clear that this practice was being used solely to prevent developments from being classed as major within the regulations and thus avoided, but not limited to, pre-application, meaningful consultation with communities. 
When this right to meaningful consultation is easily ignored, then this regulation is not fit for purpose. Given the basis of this petition, could not an independent opinion give an unbiased perspective to the issue? Could PSA fill the role? As one example to support my voluntary code of practice opinion, the design statement submitted along with these two applications stated, due to the time constraints imposed by the landowner, it was not possible to pursue a major applications planning procedure in this instance. The significant time implications created by the major applications process would have pushed the determination of the applications beyond the period afforded to the developer by the landowner and may have extended into the period within which the current local plan is superseded by the weight of material consideration imposed by the emerging local plan. For reasons described above, it was necessary to split the development into two applications. Accepting the above situation and the consequential actions, it was never intended that in not pursuing the major applications procedure, public consultation would not be carried out. End of quote. Contained within the same document, and I quote, forming part of the cartilage of Waterton Farm per Cable and lying to the north of the village of Whiteford, the site is approximately 2.6 hectares in area. A clear, unambiguous statement used to justify a major development not being classed as a major development, and the crux of my petition. This was all accepted by the local planning authority, and disappointingly, by our councillors and the local area committee. I fail to understand how a regulation can ever be deemed fit for purpose when one day a planning authority classed this development as major and then by the simple manipulation of paperwork the very same planning authority no longer considered it to be fitting that criterion. Subsequently, no public or community council consultation was ever carried out and the emerging local plan was not adopted until June 2012, some 19 months after these applications were submitted. The general public deserves better. When the example quoted above went to appeal, the reporter appointed by the Scottish ministers commented in the appeal decision notice that, and I quote, the layouts make clear that the project before me and the three dwellings project can in many ways be regarded as part of a single scheme, end of quote. Should not the local planning authority or our local area councillors be considered competent to make these decisions? If not, who is? Does the Scottish Minister have this power under Act? And I quote, but the Scottish, Scottish ministers may, as respects a particular local development, direct that the development is to be dealt with, as if indeed of being a local development, it were a major development. End of quote. When, how and by who is this power invoked? The briefing note before the committee gives one interpretation of one aspect of the regulation both based on the second sentence from Circular 5, 2009, paragraph 10. Given that this paragraph has only two sentences and having taken no account of the first sentence in the paragraph, in my opinion, a sentence very pertinent to the second sentence, it could be argued that this interpretation in the briefing note requires scrutiny. To base an opinion on one sentence, which could be argued has been taken out of context from a vast array of documentation, is open to question. More helpful to the committee may have been an interpretation of the complete paragraph. It would be interesting to know whose interpretation of Circular 5, 2009, makes it clear. Cameras, it's in conclusion... Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> you've preempted my wind-up chase. Right. It has become increasingly difficult, some would say nigh impossible, for the general public to have their voice or opinion listened to within the current system, particularly when it comes to local planning issues. What the public deserve are robust regulations. Unfortunately, as shown in my petition, the Town and Country Hierarchy of Development Scotland Regulations 2009 at, and I quote, the heart of the modernised planning system is not. It is far too easily bypassed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions from my colleagues. And, um, I mean, you make some very interesting points in your submission. Um, in terms of Scotland-wide view, what, what evidence, if any, do you have that developers are bypassing planning regulations in the way you're describing at well, local level? Well, the examples I gave in the petition shows that Alison McGuinness contacted all the, lake, the local authorities, authorities under her jurisdiction, and it seems, I would say, every local authority had evidence that this, this scheme had been used. 
Right. Thank you. Yeah, very one, so in one case in Murray, they'd actually uh, put in 10 applications for one development. All right. Thank you very much. And the final question is, what actions do you want from the Scottish Government? Well, I think uh, clarification, really. If, if there uh, are get-outs, then they should be clearly defined within the regulations. Though to say that a major development is two hectares or over, then they say, well, it will depend on this, 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 and this, then that should be included in the regulations. The, the public de deserve robust regulations, and this certainly isn't. Thank you, Thank you very much for your answers. And I'll throw them to my colleagues. Um, any colleagues wish to ask any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Chuck, just, Chuck just, Brody and then John Wilson. Intrigued. As a, as, um, you're looking at the comments in terms of Dundee Council. How many, do you have any indication of how many applications, and we know of situations where somebody applies for 50 houses and then comes back uh, and asks for another 10 houses or another five houses to be built. Have we any indication, Mr Chalmers, as to uh, you know, how, how many of these uh, the changed applications I did apply? I asked the Scottish Government, and the Scottish Minister replied it, he, they were not aware that there was a significant number of applicants, but obviously they had no idea really how many people had tried it. It tends, from what I can see, it tends to be smaller developers. I've seen you know, major developers probably go through the proper procedure, but smaller developers and individuals can quite easily bypass the system by putting in two applications. Are you, are you saying we put in the first application to be sure that? You know, they'll get that, as opposed to putting in the larger application, which they may well, know the, that they want. The, the larger application, if it's, if it's deemed to be a, a major development, then there's going to be a proper consultation process with the general public. But if they, they just, in the case of the, our local issue, was it just put in, on the same day, two applications. But originally they'd put in one application. The council told them that that was a major development. Some days later, I just went back with two applications and they said that's fine, just by the manipulation of paperwork. Thank you. And the, the case of Murray is even worse. Again, uh, the biggest problem I found was the, how the councils administered their websites for planning. Some way, up until now, Aberdeen was very easy to follow just each application, how it, can, how it was being developed through the process. But they've changed their, their system to be in line with like a Murray, which I found not user-friendly at all. You know, you can never, again, for the start the application, try and trace through every step. Totally impossible for the public. John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr. Chambers. Morning. Uh, the, quite an interesting issue you've brought before us today. Uh, one question I'd like to ask you to start off with, uh, you, you used the Aberdeenshire Council example to start this, and the, the Basically, that was where you became interested in terms of major versus other developments. You just indicated there that seven days prior to making uh, the two, the, you know, the larger the, and, uh, development, was it the, just trying to find the figures here, where there are actually 15 houses uh, and one for three houses rather than 18 homes, which were the original application. Do you know who advised the developer to actually split the application, or, or was there advice given? There, there was a... The local council sent a letter to the developer saying that uh, a pre-application consultation was required because the site was over two, two hectares. Uh, a few days later, there was a meeting between the local council uh, planners and the developer's agent where the developer's agent said then, basically saw the system, we'll just put in two applications. That wasn't his exact words, but basically he just said, I'll go away and put in two applications and that'll get around that problem. I hope the advice was more technical, <laughs> yeah. well, it, it, Mr. Chalmers. The, uh, the only reason we found it was, it was a handwritten note that uh, applied for a freedom of information, because it's very hard to find the paperwork between developers and the planning system. So if we applied for freedom of information, we've got handwritten notes showing basically how the process had worked. 
It, see, the reason for asking that question, Mr Chalmers, is one of the, the issues that we are often faced with as elected members is we rely on particularly with planning officials of local authorities to advise councillors and make recommendation to councillors about potential developments. Uh, and we expect the professional integrity of planning officers to uh, be such that they be take on board any regulations that may apply to developments. And what you've indicated is where there is a potential there to say that planning officials have colluded with developers to say we can avoid making this a major development by splitting the application up. And the official reporter, the Scottish Government's reporter, uh, based on the information provided, indicated that as far as looking at the, the two applications, then clearly this would have been deemed as a major application and would have been subject to all the public consultation regime that is required for planning applications. Do you think that, that there, is, there was a deliberate attempt in this situation to actually avoid going through the public consultation process? Well, I think the evidence shows that uh, the planners in Aberdeenshire Council had been in touch with government officials. Uh, we know from Freedom of Information that there had been verbal discussions and then emails uh, to, con to basically tell. I, I get the impression if the government officials had told the local authorities, no, you can't do this, then they wouldn't have done it. The letters I got from our Aberdeenshire Council showed that there was, they were depending on government officials approving what they'd done. Mm -hmm. can and I, can and, it, it, and based it, on the, the government's own reporter, the reporter intimated that it would have been classified as a major development. Yeah. However, the reporter makes a recommendation back to the local authority, who then will make the final deliberation on whether or not that development goes ahead. Clearly, uh, the point that I think you're beginning to, or you've raised in terms of this petition, is the lack of transparency in terms of the consultation process and the information ad available, and uh, particularly developers, and in some cases, planners could be accused of bypassing the public consultation commitments under the planning regulations 2009. I think it would, would give Aberdeenshire Council confidence was instruction, well, communication they had with government officials. At the, the, the letters that uh, we've received from the, the Council would indicate that they were comfortable with what they were doing because they were being told by government officials it was A-OK. -okay. You also, in your opening remarks, made reference to the community councils not being fully consulted. Yeah. The, my understanding is community councils are statutory consultees on planning applications. Uh, do you think this was a, a way of bypassing the community council as a statutory consult, consultee in terms of this planning process? I understand, uh, having been to the community council a few times, that the developer had made arrangements to present the plans to the community council because, but because of weather conditions, they were unable to do that. And there was never any further communication between the developer, the community council, or the, the community. Having in their uh, design statement, they said that because they hadn't uh, followed the major procedure route, they were still going to do the community council consultation and the presentation to the local community on the development, which none of that ever happened. Right, thank you very much indeed, Mr Chalmers. Yeah, it's not a question, Mr Chalmers, it's more an observation. If, if what you're saying is correct and there's no reason to doubt what, what you're saying across Scotland, effectively planners are flying under the radar here, aren't they? They're avoiding triggering off a, a much more major procedure. Well, uh, I think the planners cover themselves by contacting the, the government officials. That's, that's the card they are playing. Every time we, can, uh, we spoke to them, it's as well. Again, the government officials have said this is OK. Thank you for that. Do any of my other colleagues wish to uh, come in at this point? If, 
If not, could I just go straight to summation, which I should have picked up from previous we're finished questions. Um, clearly, it's important to get the views of Scottish Government and Royal Town Planning Institute Scotland and Heads of Planning in Scotland. Do, would members be agreeable, or do have members have alternative views or additional? John Wilson? The additional convener, Good. as usual. Right. Uh, could I also su suggest we write to Planning Aid Scotland? Uh, and when we're writing to the Scottish Government and Heads of Planning Scotland, ask them to, if they have carried out any investigations or research into the availability of information online from local authorities in relation to planning applications and the information associated with those planning applications. Because I think Mr Chalmers made a quite important point that for many of the public, they're, they're now heavily rely on online information. And if it's either difficult to get access to that online information or all the information is not online, then how do the public then feed into the planning process and make objections or support planning applications as such? Chuck uh, I just wonder, I mean, I agree with, 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 with uh, John Wilson, but I just wonder whether or not we should also write to the heads of planning not necessarily in all of the local authorities, but in selected local authorities. That seems to Carlo uh, despairing at the, at the suggestion. Um, be interesting to see whether there is a consistency of approach. Views? <laughs> Our members agree. Well, then we continue with the petition, oh, Mr. Carlo. We write to Alison McInnes and Nanette Milne as well, who appear to have been yes. raising yeah. issues of concern regarding to this to see right. what conclusions they done. Yeah. had reached or any other conversations right. they may have had arising from right. the, the, that inquiry. No, I think that's a very good, very yeah. good point. Yeah. Um, so we've got, I think, uh, as you can see, Mr. Shams, we're, we're taking this petition on, we're writing to a whole series of organisations, we're obviously keeping informed with developments, and we're obviously discuss this at uh, a future meeting once we've got all the material before us. So thanks again for coming along. We appreciate your evidence, and we'll keep you up to date with developments. If I could suspend just for one minute, because we're very much behind time, and so to allow our witnesses to spot round. Thank you. In your uh, meeting, uh, we're now on PE1519 uh, by John F. Robbins on behalf of Saver Seals Fund and Saving Scotland Seals. Members, I note by the clerk the spice briefing the petition and submission from the petitioner. Can I welcome Mr. Robbins? Uh, thank you for coming along. And again, sorry for uh, delaying you. Uh, you, you for inviting me. Uh, and I invite Mr. Robbins to make a brief presentation of a maximum of five minutes, after which I'll kick off with a couple of questions and then ask my colleagues uh, to ask further questions. Mr. Robbins. Thank you. I think that. To understand the situation regarding shooting seals in Scotland, we've got to look, got to look back at the history of it. And it goes back to the 1970 Conservation of Seals Act. Now, under that act, anyone who applied for a variation to their firearms licence, as long as they used the correct calibre of rifle, could shoot any seal at any time. Apart from anglers, anglers couldn't shoot seals during the close seasons. Now, I think in other briefing papers you have in front of you, you'll see that the, the close seasons are three months in the summer for the commons and three in the winter for the grey seals. Now, the reason angling bodies couldn't shoot the seals during that period was that they didn't have equipment to protect. Salmon netsmen had nets to protect from damage. The old Scottish office then accepted that fish farms came under the same clause and they had nets, their cage nets to protect. So they could shoot seals 365 days a year without a licence. 
but the angling bodies had to get a licence if they wanted to shoot during the close seasons. So in the past, the only licence issued was the one for people who wanted to shoot in the close season. And I remember having questions asked at Westminster about the number of seals shot in a year, and the answer came back that it was 60. That was correct, in that 60 seals had been shot under licence by angling bodies. The real figure, and it had to be a guesstimate, which I produced in the mid-1980s, and that guesstimate was that perhaps 6,000 seals a year were being shot in Scotland. That was an average of 10 per salmon farm, 10 per netting station. At the Fish Farm Conference in Inverness, I was there as a representative of a fish food sales company. And the chaps from the fish farms were quite happy to talk to me, thinking I was with the industry. And one farm was quite happy to say, we shot 60 seals last year at one farm unit. We did a documentary for Channel 4 about the shooting that went on at the netting stations. And a chap from Holtman quite openly said, I shot 89 seals at one net in one season. So that was the scale of it. My figure of five to 6,000 a year been shot wasn't challenged, and I feel it was conservative. Then we have the new act came in, the Conservation of Seals Act 1970. Uh, sorry, it was replaced uh, by, by the Marine uh, Scotland Act. And what uh, worried me with the new act is that uh, it was said that it gave seals added protection in that everyone had to have a licence to shoot seals. Now, you apply for your licence, one or two have been refused, but once you have that licence, you can shoot seals 365 days a year up to the limit that's set on your licence. That means now that angling bodies have an extra six months a year in which they can shoot seals without them through the palaver of applying for a licence. Before, they had to get a licence for the close season. Many of them didn't bother. So it gave seals estuaries protection during the close seasons, that the anglers didn't shoot them while they were breeding, they would shoot them other times a year. That protection has been removed. Now, Marine Scotland has come out with more spin than Malcolm Tucker in this one. They have said there is added protection, and it's the opposite is the case. That piece of protection has been removed. I uh, put a submission in when the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act was coming in. And one of the things we pushed on that was that fish are sentient. Fish feel pain, fish feel stress, fish uh, do react to adverse stimulus. After that act came into place, fish farmers, like any other farmer, inherited a duty to protect their stock from predators. Now that doesn't simply mean you've got to stop the fox getting in and taking a, a chunk out of your chicken. You've got to stop the seals not simply getting to the nets and biting the fish, you've got to get, stop them getting close enough to stress the fish, to cause them... Your five minutes up. I mean, we obviously have time oh, for questions. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much. So hopefully, we can pick up the rest of your points and questions. Um, thanks for your submission. You, I think you've argued, if I understand it correctly, that a thousand seals are shot under licence each year, and you've argued you think it's cruel and unnecessary. Um, but what assessment have you made on the effect of your proposals on salmon farming, for example? Well, it's up to a thousand and five can be shot this year. We're talking about an industry with a history of a history of not having to tell anyone how many seals they shot. The farms are in very remote areas. Hmm. No one uh, polices the shooting. We take it on their word that they're only shooting X number of seals. And strangely enough, they increase the request of how many seals they want to shoot. Hmm. And Marine Scotland have reduced the number of they're allowed to shoot. And I, I don't see how that balances. Hmm. The other thing is, as I say, I was going to say, that under the new Act, 
You've got to protect your fish. You cannot do that by shooting seals. Mm. You need to get someone who could shoot day and night to stop the seals getting near your right. salmon. The only way to do it, external barrier nets to stop the seals yeah. getting close. Yeah, well, you've predicted by that my next question is you were talking about installing the high-tension predator exclusion nets. I mean, I know it's very hard to be explicit about you know, the costs for that, but in your average fish farm, what would that cost you? I can be very accurate. We asked the, Scottish, the, the American government to ban the import of salmon farmed on farms where they're allowed to shoot marine, pred marine mammals. They're not allowed to do it in the States. And they have a great law in the States. If you're producing something unfairly yes, compared exactly. to our domestic producers, we can stop the, imp stop the imports. And the Canadian branch of Marine Harvest brought in the exclusion nets, 120,000 Canadian dollars to do one farm. A lot of money, but not a great deal when you think of the size of the industry. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I bring my colleagues in. Chip Brody. Yes. Can I firstly declare an interest in that, um, having worked with, thank you, worked with a company who are about to introduce an onshore a salmon fish farm, uh, and also a company who are looking to uh, not looking to, they've actually developed a submersible uh, uh, for, for tidal power which manages to avoid kill, killing seals or any other sort of marine life. So clearly there's an interest in that. Just wonder, in terms of the technology, um, I think we'll see more and more onshore fish farms actually. Um, can you explain the acoustic deterrent device and how successful that is, has been? There are various options of acoustics, some better than others. Some are still been trialled. I went to one fish farm and the chap who, the manager, said, well, we've got uh, an, uh, two acoustic devices and when we see seals in the area, we turn them on, scares them away. We don't have to do any shooting here. I think it was two years since I'd last shot a seal on that farm. I went onto the farm and I heard a generator on one of the barges. And I said to the farm manager, who actually lived on a floating house on the farm, I said, uh, I hear you've got the acoustics on. Uh, any seals about? He said, no, we don't get seals here. We've been running that 24-7 for the last three years. Now, what that means is seals are being moved away from their natural habitat. This farm was within a quarter of a mile of a traditional seal or a Korean hall outside. Yet, planning, they got the permission to put it there. Same way as they get permission to put them at the mouths of salmon rivers and the estuaries. Things that, I think if the industry started today, that would never be allowed. But the acoustic devices work on some farms. Some come back and say, yes, they're working. Again, how do we police it? There's nobody there to see exactly what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Other questioners from other colleagues? Uh, Angus Waddell. Yes, thanks, Camina. Um, good morning, uh, Mr Robbins. Uh, um, your, your petition actually covers quite a, a number of issues, um, and my colleague uh, uh, Chick Brody has already mentioned the, the high-strength, high-tension um, predator exclusion nets, uh, which have, uh, I've seen at first hand have been introduced by Marine Harvest. Um, I saw them on some of their farms up in Lochaber. Um, so it's already been introduced by major salmon farming companies, um, although there have been uh, some uh, initial difficulties with them, I believe. Um, and with regard to the onshore tank farms that uh, Mr Brodie mentioned, uh, the, the industry certainly seems to be, be heading in that direction, as well as uh, moving um, salmon farms further offshore, f further out into the, the deeper water. So. Um, there are developments within the industry which are going to address the issues that you're, con you're concerned with um, here. We've got to be careful when we talk about the anti-predator anti nets. Some of the farms are getting bigger cages and they're putting stronger tension nets around the cages. And when the seals come up, it means the seals can't push the net in far enough to grab the salmon. Mm -hmm. But it still means they can get close enough to panic and stress the salmon. It's got to be an anti-predator barrier perhaps 50 metres away from the inner cage, so the seal cannot get close to it. The onshore is probably the best way forward. You don't have lice problems, you don't have predator problems, and the pollution, instead of it lying in the seabed, you bag it up and sell it as fertiliser. 
that is the way forward. Otter Ferry started it on the Argyle uh, Peninsula. A uh, chap that was the director of the SSPCA was in charge of that. Problem was, he made a big mistake and started dabbling in genetic salmon, genetically modified salmon. Killed his business. His son now onshore farms halibut and he's making a damn good business out of it because it's a higher value and he can't compete with salmon bringing them onshore because at the moment it's still cheaper to do it in the sea because we don't regulate it properly and we could do we could the scottish uh, marine scotland could say if you want a marine fin fish farm you've got to put predator exclusion nets in but we don't it, it just doesn't happen yeah okay that, that's fair comment um with regard to um the netting stations that you mentioned um i, I think i caught that uh, piece on channel four um that, uh, that, that that you mentioned the documentary um, and you know clearly there, there are issues with netting stations uh, which i believe the government is is looking at it looked at during the aquaculture bill and it's still looking at it now um but could you develop a bit more on, on your argument with regard to to, to netting stations, would you consider, for example, that the government should buy out all the netting stations and put an end to it altogether? I, I think that is the best way forward. If uh, a salmon netsman gets a salmon in his net and he binds it in the head, he's going to get £70 to £100 pounds for it. If that salmon gets into the estuary and up the river, it's worth £2,000 to the Scottish economy because it will be caught two or three times, perhaps, before it gets to the head of the river. And anglers come in and they stimulate the tourist industry, they, pay, they spend money. And that is the, the estimated value. 70 quid if you bang it in the head of the net, 2,000 once it goes up the river. It would make a lot of sense. And the, the, again, netting stations, Zusan say that they're trialling a new acoustic device and it's working. It'd be nice to see follow that through and see if it does work. But I don't have a lot of faith in unless an external body properly auditing what's going on. I, I don't have a lot of faith in the industry at all. I'm not accusing any specific company. Just the whole industry is too remote, too secretive, and uh, it needs monitored. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just out of completeness, Mr Robbins, um, what happens to the seals that are shot? The ideal situation is that they should be brought ashore and autopsied, right? As far as I'm aware, only one has been in the last three years. Now, this might be something to do with a Scottish government meeting that was held in Inverness, I think, four years ago. Now, I tried for a long time to get onto the, you've heard of the Scottish Seals Forum. Mm. The Scottish Seals Forum, of those who are interested in whether or not seals should be shot or not shot, is three to one weighted in favour of organisations that are actively shooting or support the shooting of seals. Three to one weighted. I tried four times, four times were refused access to that uh, forum. And uh, as I say, the information there at the meeting in Inverne at Inverness was a chap from Australia had been brought over. And he spoke for five minutes. He was the key speaker and he thanked the Scottish Government. He'd never flown that class of flight before from Australia. And he really enjoyed the trip and he was enjoying being back in Scotland and seeing his old colleagues. And the best bit of advice he gave the people sitting around there, this was part of the Mori Seals uh, management plan, the best bit of advice he gave them was, if you're going to shoot seals, do it in the morning when there are no tourists about. Mm. Right? We're brought from Australia to tell them this. And that has been the attitude. If you're going sure. to do it, do it quietly. Right. Thank you for that. We, unless there's other questions from my colleagues, uh, we're, we're going to summation now where we finish questions. We're looking at the ne next steps. I mean, it seems to me there's two main things we can do is we can either um, continue this and ask the relevant bodies, or we could ask that this is referred to the Rural Affairs Climate Change Environment Committee, who I think have recently looked at the, uh, the Aquaculture and Fisheries Act Scotland 2013. So it's really a matter for, for members. I think we've got at least one member on that, I think. I mean, my, my view is probably worth referring to the committee, but again, I'll take advice from members of the committee. How do members feel? Should we refer this on to a committee that did recently look at this subject area? Thanks, Madal. Um, well, I'd be keen, convener, to, to seek uh, the views of the Scottish Government and Marine Scotland first before referring okay. to the committee. Okay. The committee has recently, as you see, um, scrutinised the, the aquaculture and fisheries bill. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, the, the issue is uh, still 
do some. So I think you're suggesting we do a bit more homework first before looking so. at that. Yeah. So we could suggest then we just ask Scottish Government, Marine Scotland, and the Special Committee on Seals for their views. John yeah. Wilson. Could I suggest, convener, we also write to the Scottish uh, Salmon Association if there is. A, I'm trying to think. And I know there's a national body that covers. Producers' organisation, I think it is now. Yeah, if we write to that organisation as well uh, to seek their views on the, the petition. Yeah, I think that's it. Are members all agreeable? Agreed. And can I thank uh, Ms Robbins for the evidence and the very technical advice you were giving us. Obviously, we are continuing this, so we'll keep you up to date with developments and discuss this again at a future meeting. And I I've read the SPICE briefing yeah. paper you've had. There are two or three major errors in it. Could you perhaps send us a note and we'll have a... I will do. That. And I'll, I'll quickly move on. I'll suspend for one minute, but thank you, Mr Robbins, for coming in. So we can, thank you. Just actually, just quickly move on, because I'm conscious that members have other meetings and things, John. Uh, members have other things to deal with. Uh, if we look at the fourth new petition, is PE 1520 by Mary Lang on unrestricted freedom to build in plots of up to one acre. Members have a note by the clerk, despite briefings and the petition. Um, as advised, I think previously, despite efforts over the last couple of months, the, the clerks have been able to make any contact with the petitioner. In such circumstances, I would suggest that since there's been no contact since the end of March, that the petition be closed. Thank you for that. Um, could I quickly go on to agenda item three, which is inquiry into tackling child sexual exploitation in Scotland. Um, we obviously have had the Scottish Government's uh, response to, I think, our very successful inquiry, our very lengthy and in-depth inquiry since the last meeting. Members may wish to, uh, to make some responses about that. Um, I would just add two points, uh, really, which has come via Bernardo's, is that I think there's two very specific things that we need to look at. Uh, one is in looked after children. Uh, remember that we had recommendation 13, which is powers of residential care workers. I think it is important we ask the Scottish Government if the National Action Plan could address the issue of clarification of the powers of residential care workers. Although there was a response in the Government's uh, note back to us, it wasn't very explicit at all. I think we need to tie down on this issue. And the second one was in post legislative scrutiny, which was recommendation 25, which is protection of children. And the um, under the pretension, sorry, Prevention of Sexual Offences, Scotland Act 2005. Again, I think we asked the Scottish Government to carry out specific work in this area, particularly around grooming. And this, in fact, echoed what the Lord Advocate's evidence to this committee was. Now, I know we asked Justice, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, to look at post legislative scrutiny. They, their work plan doesn't allow this. But at the end of the day, this is a job of Scottish Government. So if we put this back to them, they will have to look at the mechanism for that. So. My specific views are that we should take forward these two points, um, and the wider point is uh, in terms of action in overall terms. I understand, of course, we might want to wish until the National Action Plan prepared by the Minister Working Group over the summer uh, um, is addressed before we look at the wider issues. But apart from these two individual points, um, I, would, I would ask then that we pursue the two individual points now, and the wider issue we wait. John Wilson? Mayor, if I could throw in a third point. Well, it's um, to your two points that you've suggested. And the third point is to ask the Scottish Government to carry out research into the funding of local organisations providing uh, services to those children, vulnerable children, uh, who have been subject to sexual abuse. My understanding is that some local authorities are cutting back in terms of the funding of certain services. There's a project in Falkirk that's had funding cut by Falkirk Council, and it would be useful to get the uh, Scottish Government to map out what services were available, what services are currently available, and whether or not they know of services that may face potential cuts at a local level. Thank you for that, Chip Brody. Yeah. Um, two things, can you know. One, one is, having read the paper from the Minister, I'm very concerned that you know, that's this particular issue, which is probably one issue that has really affected me, me personally uh, since coming into the Parliament, uh, is subsumed into child protection uh, committees and, and associated with a long raft of uh, much needed child protection issues. Uh, and I think that's something we need um, to ensure doesn't happen, or at least that the committees uh, understand this is a particular, sure. particular issue. 
you know, a whole raft of child protection issues, and it doesn't get subsumed totally into you hear the things that we're doing. The second thing is, it would be helpful if we had some timescales on when all these things, these responses mm. are going to happen. Thank you, um, would you like us to specifically raise the point you've raised at this stage, rather than wait to... Well, let's wait until we see the National Action Okay, plan. thank you. Um, Angus MacDonald? Yes, thanks, I mean, I'm just to pick up on, on uh, John Wilson's point. Um, I think it's uh, only fair uh, to clarify that Falkirk Council is considering cutting funding to uh, a local group. Um, however, it's postponed the decision until it uh, takes in further information. But I, I've certainly uh, voiced my concern about it in the local press. Thank you. Any other member wish to contribute? So, in summary, then, there, there was a couple of points that I was requesting we do it immediately. Um, there was one question from John Wilson and one from Ch Chick Brody. I think you're prepared to wait until... Yeah, I think we should yeah. have a rigorous view of the National Action Plan when yes. it comes out. And time, time scales as well to the Minister. So I think there was four specific points we need to do now. And the committee agreeable and throw in the substantive points that wait until the National Action Plan um, has been prepared before we discuss this in, in detail. That would be agreeable. Okay. Thank you very much um, for that. Could I just move on then to agenda item four? It's PE 1408 by Andrea MacArthur on the updating of pernicious anemia. Uh, oblique vitamin B12 deficiency understanding and treatment. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Um, there is obviously a number of uh, ways forward. Could, could I suggest that we ask the Scottish Government to clarify exactly what action is taking uh, place following the publication of the BCSH guidelines and to what time scale? Agreeable. Thank you for that. Uh, John Wilson. Sorry, just to, to add into this, when we are writing to the Scottish Government, could I seek uh, that we ask the Scottish Government as well as clinicians, how this information will be disseminated to GPs, because for many patients, it's the, the treatment by a GP or a practice nurse that raises questions about the uh, B12 deficiency and how uh, the GP practice or practice nurse actually provides treatment uh, for B vitamin B12 deficiency. Yeah, fair point. Members yeah. agreeable? Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, next petition is PE 1480 by Amanda Capel on behalf of the Frank Capel Alzheimer's Awareness Campaign on Alzheimer's and Dementia Awareness. Members have a note by the clerk, and I'm sure all members will wish to pass condolences on to Amanda Capel following uh, the death of yeah. Frank Capel. Um, uh, whilst inviting contributions from members, can I suggest that, um, as the Scottish Government has indicated, that we'll look into the provision of personal care for under 65 year olds with complex needs. The committee may wish to ask for more details on the scope and timescale of the work. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for that. The um, next one is third petition is PE1492 by Alan Kennedy on co location of GP practices and community pharmacies. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. And is Richard going to speak? Is it at this point? Yeah. Um, and can I invite contributions from members? Is it, is it this petition? No, I don't Oh, it's Strep B. Right. Sorry, Chip Brody. The uh, Cabinet Secretary, the Government, have now uh, indicated their position on this. Um, I have indicated to the Cabinet Secretary that we need to ensure there will be no conflict of interest going forward okay. in terms of co location of community pharmacies and GP practices. But um, that will be a matter for. <laughs> Further review. Thank you for that. And just before we go to submission, I think Dr. Richard Simpson, you've got an interest in this petition? Yes, I have. Um, can I say, first of all, that I welcome the fact that the government has undertaken a fresh consultation. Uh, members will remember that we thought we'd solved this problem in the last parliament, and we clearly hadn't. There's uh, considerable anxiety amongst remote and rural practices about the uh, development of pharmacy. So we are faced with this dichotomy, as the committee appreciates, between wanting to provide good, full pharmacy services to communities on the one hand, on the other hand, not to uh, disrupt or in any way reduce the GMS services that are being offered by general practitioners. Um, the, the new regulations, uh, which have been tabled now and will be considered by the Health and Sport Committee next week at its meeting, um, and I don't propose to move to annul them because I think they are a considerable advance on what we've had before, but there are some questions which I'm, I've just raised for the committee's information as much as anything, and, and 
perhaps uh, invite them to consider holding the petition open a little longer to see what the response is next week from the Minister. Uh, first of all, there is this new concept of protecting rural and remote practices by designating them as areas where there should not be a pharmacy. And that is new and that is very welcome. But there isn't really a very clear definition as to what that is going to be. And they will be reviewed every three years. And frankly, and I have to declare an interest here as a fellow of the College of General Practitioners and a member of the BMA, uh, that, uh, frankly, three-year review when you're running a business, which is what GPs are doing, in my view, is not adequate. You need, you need certainty over a longer period of time. So I'm slightly concerned about the three-year matter, as well as the vagueness of the definition. We don't know precisely. We say that the practices are going to be protected or uh, designated as protected, but we don't know what it is. Uh, I have some concerns about the consultation process. That's now to be agreed between the applicant and the board. There does not appear to be any role for either the GP or the community in agreeing the consultation process. And nor is there any external agency looking at this as there is with the rest of the health service through the Scottish Health Services Council. So I think there's something lacking there in terms of ensuring that this consultation actually does follow a process We've no idea what that process is. It's not defined within the regulations. Um, the, uh, yeah, there, there is no requirement on the Practice and Health Board jointly to agree specifically on any changes to services which might occur following the loss of dispensing. And members will know that uh, Millport is the worst example we've had where the GPs have resigned entirely and it's costing us as taxpayers and costing the government and health board a huge amount of money to provide locums because they can't get GPs. Uh, but the circumstances in Lucas, where there's been a reduced service, in Medvin, in my constituency also, where the uh, GMS service previously was a full-day service and is now a half-day service, and, and patients have to travel in from Medvin to Perth, none of that came out in the process of licensing. Uh, and we've now got three further practices in my area, Aberfoyle, Colin, and Drummond. Drummond, where the GPs have both resigned as of the 31st of July. Colin, where there are particular problems, which I won't go into, but look like there's going to be a diminished number of GPs present. And Aberfoyle, where the appeal has just been upheld, despite the fact that in the initial consideration by the local pharmacy board, or the, the appropriate board, the, the pharmacy was regarded as, as not being potentially not being sustainable, which is one of the criteria under the new regulations. And then there's the matter of whether there should be any redress to practices affected by future licences. This has not been a practice in the past, and I would not argue for GPs to be in a position to sell goodwill. They never have been and they never should be. Uh, this is a, they, their dispensing rights are given to them by the GP, by the board. They are required to dispense by the board they should not have the right to sell that goodwill. But nevertheless, they make an investment. If I can give you an example again, the Drummond practice invested some two years ago uh, some three and a half, four thousand pounds in software to improve the safety of their dispensing. Losing their license, losing their requirement to dispense, they've got no recompense for this, none. And it seems to me that, you know, there should be at least an assessment of the effect on the practice of the loss of, of dispensing both in terms of their software and in terms of the, the premises. Uh, is, are there arrangements for redundancy of the dispensing staff? Uh, are there two peer arrangements? That, again, doesn't come up under the regulations. Um, and then, uh, uh, finally, in terms of going forward, there isn't anything in the, in, the, in the new regulations which promotes the joint establishment of GP pharmacies, which are co uh, GPs and pharmacists co-located. And indeed, under the present situation, I understand pharmacists locally can object to that co-location as giving someone an unfair advantage, and therefore it may not occur. So I think there are, there are as I'm sorry to go on at length, uh, convener, because I know you've, you've got a busy agenda, but you know, it does seem to me when we're having yet a further shot at this, we need to get it right. Uh, and, and, and I just wonder if the committee would uh, uh, do, uh, consider keeping it open until at least the Minister has answered the questions which they now have notice of as a result of your courteously allowing me to actually uh, uh, speak to the committee. Uh, th thanks, uh, Mr. Tuchson, for that. You'll know 
probably I've had some regional interest in this in both Bimbekela and Caithness, so I know firsthand how difficult an issue this is. So I'm grateful for Mr Kennedy bringing this petition forward. Uh, Chip Brody? Uh, yes, if I may, I made the point earlier, uh, and with Dr Simpson's vast experience uh, in, in, in medical practice, how do we ensure, I, mean, I wasn't sure whether you were in favour of, of GPs having a financial interest in, in the co-located pharmacy or not. I have a major concern that people should do their core activities and, and have, there should be no bias as a consequence to select particular prescriptions or you know, any beneficial, you know, financial beneficial uh, occurrence as far as the GP is concerned. I mean, how is that going to be overcome? Sorry, Ken Cross, just to say that, just to remind members that Dr Simpson's not a witness here, no, 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 I, 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 forward. I, I and I'm, I'm very reluctant to open this up philosophically again. Well, well, so, so. A, it, there is a dilemma there, but I think you, with the, if you go back 15 or 20 years, it was a serious dilemma because there was no control over GP prescribing, whereas there now are, under, there are at least uh, agreements between health boards and GPs on their prescribing budgets. They are now much more tightly supervised, and if practices are actually prescribing in a way which is inappropriate, for example, by prescribing branded products where they could prescribe generic products, uh, which are much cheaper and possibly have less of a, of a profit margin on it for the dispenser, uh, then uh, that is something which the health board should be able to control. But it may be there needs to be something specific in the regulations, which on the one hand encouraging this co-location where appropriate, uh, to, in order to introduce full pharmacy services in areas which might not benefit from that, on the other hand, there may need to be a memorandum of understanding with the general practitioners to ensure that that co-location does not lead to any sort of abuse. Jackson Carlo? I'd like to move that we support Dr Simpson's suggestion that we maintain and keep the petition open and the expectation and hope that a copy of the official record will find its way to ministers in order that they can facilitate appropriate fulsome responses to the questions that the, the committee intend to put to them next week and we can then look at it again in the light of that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, can I ask the other members' views? Whilst that is an option, obviously there is a possibility that we refer it to Health and Sport Committee, which is the lead committee for the regulations. John Wilson. Mayor, I'm minded to refer this on to the Health and Sport Committee as they are currently examining uh, the regulations that would be more appropriate if that committee uh, were passed on the information we have. Mr Simpson eloquently gave his questions that he will no, be doubt, no doubt be asking next week uh, to the Minister of Cabinet Secretary on this issue. The difficulty is, is I don't want this committee to be a backup committee for an, an inquiry or work that's been done by another committee. Uh, I think we need to give uh, respect to that committee, uh, the Health and Sport Committee, in relation to their work rather than just if all else fails, it comes back to this committee mm. so we can examine it further. Mm. I think the, by referring it on to the Health and Sport Committee, and I'm sure Mr Simpson will make a very good job of raising all these questions and getting the answers that he requires at the Health and Sport Committee. Thank you for that. So we've got two proposals. I just around the members who haven't spoken so far. Uh, Chip Brody, could you no. get your views on which one you support? Yeah, that's uh, either uh, continuing it and, or uh, referring it on to Health and Sport. I'd refer it on, I think. OK, David Torrance. I'd refer it on. Anne McTaggart. I think Dr Simpson's made it clear that um, there are questions still to be... that go unanswered. Um, I, I would rather that we had dealt with them before then moving them on. Okay. Um, Angus McDonald. Yeah, I think there's a strong argument, Convener, to refer it to the Health and Sport Committee. Right. OK, well, thanks, colleagues, for that. By I think majority, we've agreed we're going to first the Health and Sport Committee is the lead committee for the regulations. And could I thank Dr Simpson for coming along today and, and for your expertise. And we, we greatly appreciate your comments. Thank you for that. I'll quickly move on um, to the next petitions, PE 1505 by Jackie Watt on awareness to threat being pregnancy and infants. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Could I point out particularly that... Um, that Jane Plamus, the chief exec of the, the UK group, um, has an additional paper. Um, and I think she was particularly, uh, her view, if members haven't a chance to read it, she's particularly keen that we'd, we actually write rather than defer consideration. But again, it's up to members um, to look at the next steps. I think having a quick glance through all the papers, 
Uh, I think my view would be we should write to Scottish Government and NHS Health Scotland to request that the petitioner and other stakeholders are consulted as part, as part of the revision for the Ready Steady Baby Leaflet to include information in GPS. Agreed. John, Agreed. everyone agreeable? Agreed. Thank you for that. Uh, the fifth current petition is uh, PE 1503 by Mike Burns on behalf of the average speed cameras and the nine are not the answer. On a review of A9 speed camera proposals, members of the note by the clerk and submissions. Um, members, I think, will remember that I think Mike Burns gave evidence uh, to us on this uh, particular issue. I think it's quite clear um, the Scottish Government view. Um, I know as a regular in A9 that the cameras are already constructed. They're under trial. They will be operational in uh, October. They're also part of the increase in HGV speeds from 40 to 50. That's part of the trialling. And members will know I've taken members will know that I've taken a, um, a strong view on the increase in speed limit to 50, which is not part of a petition, but just so we've got a balanced view on this. So I think Mike Burns has obviously um, done a, a very great, good piece of work with the individual petition, but I don't personally see what more we can do with the Scottish Government, because the Scottish Government made their view absolutely clear. Having said that, um, if we were looking to close, Mr Burns does have two or three extra points which he was wondering if we would take up which in, is in this paper. One is that the Scottish, uh, the Scottish Government undertake an e economic impact study um, on speed cameras on the Highland economy. Now, that was commissioned, so that's not news to the Scottish Government, it's just enacting it. That the A9 Safety Group had become more a public forum and that we, there's a publishing of driver surveys which are already taking place. So, I, my view would be I cannot see any other choice but to close, unfortunately. Um, but I do think it's important we do chase up these points with Scottish Government. The first one is, is already enacted, as far as I'm aware. The surveys are there, just need to be put out. The issue about this, the, the, the A9 Safety Group being a public forum is obviously a matter for Scottish Government, Transport Scotland. But out of courtesy to the constituent, I think we could ask the, the Minister the views on that. So, sorry going on, but this is obviously quite an important uh, issue in the Hanson Islands. Can I ask members their views on this? Are members agreeable that eight yeah. we close but chase yeah. out the points that's outstanding? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, so could I, uh, could I formally close the meeting but ask members if they could stay behind just for a couple of minutes or some administrative things we need to chase out? There's nobody in the gallery, is there?